Around the th uh, three years ago, uh, I chaired uh, one of the uh, ACSA annual meetings. And this is uh, the convention for uh, academics and architecture in North America. And uh, the prompt that myself and my co-chair, Lola Shepard, uh, issued was about the relationship between the core and the periphery of uh, architectural education. Uh, that is, uh, the core curriculum versus uh, the more kind of experimental things we do in the upper levels and vertical studios. Uh, so, but uh, it was actually more focused on the core. Um, and whatever uh, was academic activities in schools of architecture that fell outside it, in effect, uh, almost by default, became uh, the peripheral or the experimental. Now, I was uh, pretty shocked to discover there are 225 schools of architecture in North America in the, that belong as members to the ACSA. Uh, I was really stunned by uh, the number. And uh, in the kind of prompt to come and uh, deliver papers and pr uh, give presentations about uh, the academic activities in and surrounding the core uh, curriculum, uh, I, I, I more or less saw that there were, in the 225 schools of architecture in North America, there were 225 versions of the core. So it, it raised for me a kind of a, uh, uh, and, and that was a surprise. I thought there would be more consistency, uh, and there wasn't much consistency that uh, I, I saw uh, as an organizer of it. And uh, so I, I drew a couple of conclusions that maybe uh, to some degree are somewhat controversial ones. Uh, one, uh, I think uh, what we call the core curriculum is constituted by a number of uh, kind of legacy kind of orthodoxies that uh, we continue to teach and constitute our institutions by without, uh, uh, but, and we've been doing it for so long that there's some sort of uh, conceptual disconnection from what they were there for in the first place. And uh, the, it, the, it was almost a kind of collage of uh, different ideas of what's fundamental. And uh, so, uh, what I walked away with was the idea that uh, the idea that there is a core constituting uh, the architectural education is the thing that we most felt strongly about, that there is a core, but uh, no one could really give any kind of definitive opinion about uh, how that core is to be constituted. So since then, uh, coinciding with uh, uh, the starting of the EDGE uh, programs. Uh, I thought that this is a very necessary type of program that's missing in architectural education today. We have uh, professional degree programs for training professionals, for training uh, architectural professionals. And then uh, we have PhD programs uh, for training and educating scholars. Uh, there's something missing in between that focuses on theory and pedagogy constituting uh, the design studio or design instruction. And uh, to some degree it may be seen as a kind of almost an accidental byproduct of the economy of the architectural industry that these kind of hybrid figures begin to emerge uh, post-war uh, in the late 60s. Uh, and there are some uh, interesting uh, academic institutions where this hybrid architect begins to emerge. That is, uh, people like myself, or Federer Colaton, or our director, Hernan Diaz Alonso, or Christie, or Marcelin. Pretty much uh, everybody here on the faculty of SciArc, to some degree, is a hybrid of uh, an educator, a theorist, and also an architect. So what I think is interesting is that uh, the problem of the design studio and this pedagogy begins to uh, acquire some consistency as a thing itself that is outside of perhaps more traditional theories of uh, how the discipline is constructed. So the design theory and pedagogy program uh, has a dual role. One is to give practical training and experience to future design instructors. 
to the future teachers in the design studio, what we call the design studio. To some degree, I think uh, what a design studio is today, uh, coming at us from history, I think is a debatable thing in and of itself. But it is uh, a crucial component of uh, how we continue to construct and transform what architecture is as a discipline in conjunction with its legislated definitions as a profession. So uh, we have in our initial year uh, eight students. And I wanted to foreground the students a little bit uh, before going into uh, the subject matter of our debate. Uh, because uh, this is about uh, beginning to develop uh, individuals that could have presence in the field, uh, I think uh, this is why I wanted to emphasize a little bit uh, the people that are coming through the program. So uh, if I just go kind of uh, from the top row from the left, uh, we have uh, Garrett Ammerman. Uh, he is a graduate of SciArc's uh, MR program. And uh, he uh, uh, is going to, he, he has just been hired by our undergraduate chair to teach in the undergraduate BR program here. So uh, it's kind of an interesting transition for Garrett, going from graduation straight to being on the faculty. Uh, Henry Yang uh, is uh, going to be uh, moving over to our uh, uh, frenemy school, uh, UCLA and he's going to be uh, working towards a PhD career there. Uh, we have then Maria Panovi, Kirilla Panovi, who is currently torn a little bit between uh, her possible future uh, as a practitioner and as a teacher. Perhaps she'll end up doing both. Uh, but Maria uh, has uh, been a practicing architect for a number of years already. So uh, I guess uh, something I want to emphasize too here is uh, the students that are coming into this program are coming at it from various uh, places in the architectural world and coming with different backgrounds. Uh, then we have uh, Majida Alanai who uh, is not here today because she has already started her uh, job. Uh, she uh, is now a full-time instructor at Kent State. So I believe Majida is watching online. So uh, uh, hello, Majida. And <laughs> I want you to know we're all very proud of you here. Uh, then uh, on the bottom row, we have Matthew Lopez, uh, who is a former student of Ferda Colaton, who's here on the panel. And uh, he is also watching online. And he is over at the uh, RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And he has also started a new job teaching there. Then we have Ryan Skavnicki, who, who is here, but uh, who uh, maybe uh, 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 one, one of our more interesting students in, in the school. And uh, he'll be uh, coming up to speak uh, in a, in a shortly. Uh, Ryan will be uh, assisting uh, Jeff Kipnis uh, this fall here at SciArc. Uh, he's going to be working with me in undergraduate 4A studio. And we'll also be working uh, on the staff of SciArc channel. Right? OK. Uh, then we have. Puyan Rui, who uh, has an interesting background uh, from Iran and has uh, completed an advanced degree already previously here at SciArc. And uh, he is uh, developing uh, uh, scholarship in, re in relationship to uh, the life and discourse of Friedrich Kiesler. And uh, he will also be uh, working here in Los Angeles uh, for Andrew Zago, uh, beginning, uh, I believe, on, mo on Monday. And then uh, we'll also be uh, doing some assisting here this fall before uh, moving on, uh, presumably, in the spring. Uh, Wendy Cox uh, is an interesting student we had uh, who's already a tenured professor at uh, Norwich. And uh, she uh, came here on sabbatical. And she uh, is taking a leave of absence and will be continuing uh, next summer. 
Uh, she's gone back to teaching at her regular day job, and she'll be returning to us to complete her degree uh, next summer. So looking forward to having you back, Wendy. I think Wendy is also watching from Vermont. Okay. So uh, I wanted to go through uh, some of the work and uh, the setup of the curriculum. Uh, the way I explain it to uh, uh, incoming students is uh, uh, the design theory and pedagogy program here uh, in some sense is related to maybe the idea of a teaching hospital where uh, once you've completed, uh, I guess, the more uh, uh, classroom-based education, uh, it's pretty typical for doctors to find a residency in a hospital and get practical experience. So uh, you may have noticed uh, the person that comes in with the doctor when they come to check your temperature or stick an IV in you, just uh, watching and observing what's happening. So uh, it's built on the idea of uh, SciArc being a pedagogical laboratory in addition to everything else we do. So the design studio of this program asks the students to engage in uh, gaining actual teaching experience in the, in the program. So uh, they're uh, teaching in the core curriculum in the fall, in the spring they're teaching in our vertical studios, and then in the summer uh, they get to do a, a kind of project on their own. So uh, in the fall uh, there's a, a design studio where uh, the deliverable of the studios to develop new core curriculum and then it's paired with uh, what we call the design lab where this past fall they were working with Todd Gannon on the history of architectural pedagogy from the Ecole de Bozar going through the Bauhaus to Texas Rangers, Boyarsky's AA, Schumi's Columbia, et cetera, and coming all the way up to the present to understand that uh, there is a history of architectural pedagogy that to some degree is yet to be written in, as a larger project. So I think this is a, a longer term ambition of the design theory and pedagogy program also to develop some of this history, to do the, the kind of groundwork that could lead to a, a historical understanding of pedagogy. So, uh, in the spring, the students, as they're working with uh, the vertical studios here at SciR, uh, their deliverable uh, for that studio is to develop their own advanced studio brief. And so syllabus writing is interesting to consider not just as a contract, but also as uh, fully a form of writing that develops a, a theory in conjunction with an implementation of it through pedagogy. So how advanced studio briefs are written, I think is an interesting aspect of architectural culture today, where the discourse of uh, design problems uh, that we were interested in exploring in various schools around the country and the world are explored and concretized through the writing of syllabi. So uh, this is the exercise of the spring, and then that uh, advanced studio brief, uh, almost like a doctor experimenting on themselves, uh, they, they are asked to do that project in the summer semester. So the principle here is uh, it's one thing to write the curriculum and to write the syllabi and to construct the theory for the project. It's another thing to actually do the project. And then the, the game of the summer is to make adjustments then to the brief based on the experience of doing that project. So what I'd like to quickly go over are just some uh, highlights from the work this summer. Uh, this is uh, what you, what's been here on the screen is the work of Puyan Ruhi who has been uh, exploring some of uh, uh, the experiments that have been going on here at SciArc and at other schools in relationship to maybe uh, uh, unconventional forms of figuration and uh, new kinds of architectural massing uh, based in his uh, kind of uh, uh, in a milieu that maybe uh, hasn't uh, ever uh, 
encountered this discourse before. So this is uh, Tehran. And the experiment here is to contextualize that uh, more theoretical discourse in a completely new context. So a lot of uh, the kind of formal uh, experiments that have been going on, uh, say here at SciArc, in producing, uh, I guess, strange masses and figuration and volumetric conditions, and in conjunction with mid misregistered graphics, I think, is being deployed here in, a, I suppose, in a more politically charged context. And uh, it was also, uh, uh, to some degree, driven in, by an interest in being critical about uh, Tehran's legacy of, uh, I guess, European architecture that was deployed there as a kind of form of uh, colonialist uh, misunderstanding, which oddly constitutes uh, the normal in that milieu. So these are government buildings for Tehran that uh, are somehow uh, oddly appropriate, misappropriated uh, European architecture being deployed in the Middle East. Uh, this is Garrett Ammerman's work. Uh, Garrett's been um, very focused on uh, topics that might be more associated with our visual studies curriculum. Uh, he is uh, very focused on uh, I guess certain uh, takes on the problem of abstraction and architectural representation. Uh, in particular, he's interested in the use of silhouettes as a way to estrange uh, more familiar uh, forms. So for example, uh, you, and, and this is something that's not entirely new. It's something we've seen uh, in recent contemporary practice where, say, the familiar silhouette of a gable roof uh, that is quite clear what its meaning is in silhouette, uh, once uh, uh, developed into a three-dimensional form that contradicts the typology of the gable roof, would then embed some of that familiarity in something that's not immediately recognizable. You would have to almost see it in silhouette to see that it's actually there. So this kind of uh, misrepresentation uh, uh, of uh, a known form through uh, a kind of counter three-dimensionality, I think, is the kind of general interest. And uh, there's a kind of uh, perhaps a, almost a kind of subversive or sneaky interest in uh, producing some critical understanding of context by uh, deploying a tool like this. So, for example, he's been uh, particularly interested in a site in Japan, uh, in Kyoto, actually, right? And uh, this kind of uh, iconic silhouette of the temple. And then he was uh, taking it through all kinds of uh, 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 somewhat uh, complex esoteric manipulations into flattening into silhouette to then pull it back out into three-dimensionality to make objects that look anything but a temple. Ultimately, this evolved into uh, a more general problem and interest in projection itself. And uh, kind of midway through, uh, uh, there was a kind of uh, uh, obsessive compulsive interest in uh, building the site model, which, uh, was, which I personally found absolutely fascinating. Uh, the site model uh, that represents a context in many ways is uh, just uh, the kind of default of the architectural project, the kind of background against which uh, the designed figures are read. And I thought it was uh, uh, quite intriguing to put a lot of attention on just how that site model is built. So uh, what, what it ended up becoming, uh, almost uh, to the kind of complete sacrifice of the designed project itself, you know, which, I, which I also found perverse and interesting, uh, 
uh, it became a, pr a, pr a project of modeling the context in a very strange way. So uh, it involves some very convoluted digital techniques of, um, uh, I guess, uh, against uh, uh, the intentions of certain software extracting three-dimensional GIS uh, data and to produce meshes then, then to, uh, a lot of very complex uh, techniques for processing these complex uh, high triangle count meshes uh, for 3D printing on the color 3D printer we've had that hardly anybody ever uses. So what became interesting was uh, this model that became a kind of hybrid of uh, the three-dimensional site model and a photograph of the site that it seemed to hover between, uh, say, the screen capture you get from Google Earth and then the model that uh, you have in front of you when we review. So uh, I, I don't know ultimately like what second lives this will have and hopefully he'll continue to pursue some of these problems as faculty member here at SIR. Some of these uh, photographs of the model are, I think, quite uncanny because uh, it almost looks like, uh, say, that screen capture, what you see on Google Earth. Uh, Henry Yang has been interested in humor uh, uh, since, I think, he started his MARC program here. And, uh, and he is a funny guy, actually. He has a very... <laughs> twisted sense of humor I've come to learn. You know. and, uh, and I think he's also uh, become quite interested in the existing discourse about humor that, for example, Jeff Kipnis has been very interested in, and the comic uh, Andrew Zago has also been very interested in this. And uh, uh, what we started out doing uh, was almost a kind of impossible project of trying to, I mean, impossibly ambitious project of trying to figure out what's funny and how do you make things funny. And that uh, it seems like the most obvious thing in the world to identify what's funny, but it's difficult to identify the techniques. So, uh, uh, Henry, you spent a lot of the uh, time in the beginning of the summer just watching, like, Louis C.K. and things like that, right? <laughs> Doing like a close reading of, uh, of uh, you know, the comic. And, but uh, w what was interesting about this was it was in conjunction to things that are perhaps uh, maybe more obscure, like uh, the work of Le Cue and these kinds of uh, underground uh, precedents or canonical works, uh, twisted canonical works from the past. And uh, he, he was trying to understand Le Cue as a kind of predecessor in this uh, exploration of the comic or the absurd. So uh, uh, what, what we ended up here with Henry was uh, uh, to try to develop some uh, pedagogy that could foreground what conceptual problems might be lie at the heart of the comic. Uh, to some degree, I never thought there was any room for humor in architecture, but uh, I, I don't know. I might be in the minority there. But uh, uh, despite uh, what theoretical underpinnings the problem of humor might have in architecture, still uh, in the instruction uh, in a design studio, there has to be certain techniques that uh, it needs to be dissolved into. So I think an interesting moment for him was uh, developing some uh, close uh, study of uh, the traditions of anamorphosis in the visual arts and sculpture. So almost like a punchline in a joke being kind of uh, sublimated in a very long buildup, uh, anamorphosis became a way to sublimate uh, what was subversive or, or counter-theoretical uh, in the work. So uh, he was studying uh, an interesting artist that I forget the name of right now, but uh, it, it was a pretty interesting precedent, uh, we'll, we'll return to that word in a second, in looking at uh, three-dimensional techniques uh, of uh, massing and figuration for attenuating a collection of parts uh, to an extreme in order to make less obvious uh, the, the legibility of the overall assemblage. So these are just some images from it. 
And uh, I guess you could see it a little bit more closely here, but it's uh, Duchamp's uh, urinal. That is somehow being anamorphically stretched into something completely unrecognizable. And there you could see it, I guess, a little more closely. Yeah, I don't know where this goes, Henry. Well, I think you're going to have to keep uh, working on this. Yeah, but, but I did laugh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Majiba, uh, who's not here, uh, she uh, was interested in uh, what she was calling digital dissection. Uh, and, and some of these uh, terminologies, I think, uh, uh, transform over time. I know speaking for myself, uh, the words I assign to the work have evolved and changed uh, over the two decades I've been teaching. And uh, she also struggled with the terminology here. Uh, is dissection the actual appropriate word? But uh, what she was interested in was how uh, through the three-dimensional interface of our uh, software that things can be cut up and taken apart uh, to an extreme degree that is somewhat unprecedented when we compare it back to our analog days where it actually took a lot of labor to cut things up. So the kind of negligible labor of, uh, of uh, producing, uh, I guess, the taking apart of things and the negligible effort it takes to analyze a whole in new uh, component manners, I think became uh, her primary focus. So uh, what became interesting for her was to associate this idea of, say, the digital cut-up with also an interest in uh, the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch and the production of a kind of supersaturation of elements. So uh, this was her, her kind, of, uh, kind of initial study model of uh, producing a kind of uh, uh, Hieronymus Bosch-like uh, non-hierarchical multiplication of figures uh, that uh, had no clear hierarchy or axis. And ultimately, this became a kind of project of uh, producing something that existed in between the world of sculpture and painting. And I think this, too, is a kind of project that will con con it's a kind of initial uh, uh, set of uh, chess moves, I think, for what I hope will be a much longer term project for her in contemporary visuality. Matt Lopez, who's uh, over there in RPI now, he uh, became interested in the uh, problem of extraction of profiles for the production of uh, new objects. So you take the profiles out of known buildings and you compress them together to produce new three-dimensional objects that can construct things that uh, don't resemble in any way the original objects. So to some degree, there's a very kind of uh, esoteric, narrowly focused uh, pedagogical interest. So these are some of the initial more kind of abstract, if you will, objects generated from profiles extracted from uh, canonical works. And then uh, he uh, wanted to deploy it in a kind of more straightforward manner as a kind of addition to a uh, train station. So this is a kind of site and then the kind of uh, deploying of these uh, kind of uh, difficult to read uh, architectural interventions that are generated out of a whole uh, mat of sectional profiles. So uh, we have uh, Ryan Skavnicki's uh, brief here. And uh, this might take a little bit to explain, uh, but uh, what was interesting about this project was uh, the entire uh, experiment in kind of uh, uh, turning the design process upside down and doing things out of sequence. 
doing all the things we would normally do, but doing it completely out of sequence, was being done out of uh, kind of a general interest he's had since the beginnings in countercultures and uh, the kind of uh, cultural phenomena of the remix, the Instagramming of all existence, uh, how uh, the meanings of things are getting lost and how things are getting combined and recombined perpetually. So the way it became distilled into a pedagogy was an idea of asking students to initially make, what was it, 50 objects, right? 50 objects that were supposed to be completely beyond the criteria or of beautiful or ugly. The only criteria is to make 50 and to make sure that they were different from each other. And he produced a couple of videos here. Uh, this one is just a quick pass through all 50 that he made. So we had a lot of debates during this. Are they sufficiently different from each other? To some degree, they're all kind of weird, so maybe they're all the same. So what kind of criteria do you have to construct difference? And I think uh, uh, the good answer coming back from him, I thought was, uh, well, that's precisely the point, to really challenge the students to confront the problem of how to produce a different thing. And to do so without a kind of conceptual apparatus that then generates it. That there's a kind of brutal, almost absurd kind of uh, mania of producing difference with absolutely no meaning. Then uh, the next stage was to then situate them within a kind of a brief narrative. Uh, I found these to be kind of hilarious and intriguing and provocative. So th the whole thing was to take some of those objects uh, these meaningless objects, put them into some context, and then to write just some, a very short narrative description. I could play all of these, Ryan, but maybe just one more. That was an interesting uh, uh, experimentation with uh, these kinds of uh, GIF animations. and Like it's basically still an image, but with some minor thing being animated, which I found quite interesting. And then uh, the idea is to take one and to start developing it. And we had a, a number of uh, discussions about the kind of absurdity and also importance of at some stage in the design project uh, turning it into a building. And uh, we spent a lot of time talking about what does it mean to turn something into a building? And how do we know how to do that? What do we need to know in order to be able to to, just to be capable of doing that. And that although it's often kind of pointed to as that stupid moment in the design studio where now we've got to turn it into a building, it's actually uh, the most important moment in the design studio, which is what we, I think, both learned by doing this. So it, it, it's... I suppose a continuation of the problem of situating it, putting it into a context. But then uh, it's a much more elaborate problem of situating uh, a given object uh, because it has to be done fully in three-dimensionality. It also has to begin to speculate about material conditions and what we call program, that is what do we do in there, what's it for, how much does it cost, how do we build it. These are all, I think, uh, important problems of uh, bringing some meaning to a meaningless object. So normally I think a lot of these criteria would be front loaded at the beginning of a design process where the intentions and the productive milieu is already absorbed as a given, as a way to start the project and then comes the kind of uh, madcap uh, rush towards producing some form that can capture those criteria.
So this is, uh, uh, in, what I think, a very interesting exercise in turning that process upside down, where you start by assuming the, maybe the absurd uh, conclusion that it doesn't, the form doesn't mean anything at all. And then the entire project is about bringing meaning to it. And most interestingly, I, I thought uh, at the very end uh, of this process uh, came the, the problem of producing the technical drawings. And I think this is something that I would have loved to have seen uh, more of. Uh, I, I wish we had more time to keep running with this, but to really start developing the technical criteria and to develop some understanding of the meaning of drawings like this within the architectural discipline, I think ultimately is where this kind of absurd, hilarious project starts getting uh, serious. You know, so I hope uh, you continue with this. So uh, because this is the design theory and pedagogy program, we're going to end by asking uh, the students to come up to deliver uh, provocation. Uh, our conversation is going to consist in really just three topics. Uh, this is for a panel discussion. The first is about precedence and how we use precedence in architecture. And this might be uh, not obvious, but uh, an unrelated problem of history, because I think uh, often we would see this as related problems, history and precedent. But we're separating this, and uh, hopefully they'll make clear to you why we're doing it. And the third is uh, abstraction. And this is uh, the debate for today. And as you saw from the brief blurb I wrote for our panel discussions, it seems to me outside of the design studio, the, the basic assumption of the core curriculum is that it involves history, precedence, and abstraction. And this is what I'd like to try and debate today. To what degree does it continue to have rele relevance? What's at stake in it? Why do we have it? What should it be used for? And so on. So uh, I'm going to invite uh, Garrett up to talk about precedence. He'll be followed by Henry Yang speaking about history. And then we're going to end with uh, Ryan talking about abstraction. And this should be fairly brief. OK. Good afternoon. Uh, the use and abuse of precedence. Though the role of precedence in design studios changes between faculty and schools, precedents are a normal part of most design studios. Nonetheless, the way precedents are used varies greatly, both in terms of content and in sequencing in the design process. Earlier in core studios, relevant precedents serve as examples of programmatic and massing strategies. <clears throat> in these instances, precedents are presumably used to build knowledge. At other times, precedents are used to help the designer get over a sort of writer's block. In these instances, the challenge often becomes one of eventually erasing the evidence of the original precedents. Finally, and this is probably the most well-known use of precedents, they are used as a source of authority, where canonical works are used to form arguments of legitimacy. Often in more experimental studios today, the organization or historical significance of precedents is ignored in order to move towards a more in order to move towards the defamiliarization of its formal qualities. At the same time, precedents are used in reverse to make abstract objects look more like familiar architecture. Historically, the meaning and use of precedents has changed. At the Ecole de Beaux Arts, precedents were viewed with a much higher authority than they are today. They were seen as ideal examples of design and copied relentlessly. If, if the study of canonical works was the antithesis of modernist thinking, it is interesting to see it reemerge as a precedent with, within a juridical rubric. In other professions, the appropriate use of precedence is clearly legislated. In law, precedents establishing interpretations of the law are a fundamental mechanism of justice. In medical practice, precedents serve an even more vital function. Any course of treatment must be verified before they can be legally prescribed. From a disciplinary point of view, the use of precedence can, be, can vary widely in architecture. But from the point of view of the profession, according to NAB, the use of precedence seems to be more clearly defined. Student performance criteria, SPCs, 
A6, use of precedence, states the student should learn an ability to examine and comprehend the fundamental principles present in relevant precedence and to make informed choices about the incorporation of such principles into architecture and urban design projects. This is the most explicit definition about the role of precedence for the purpose of accreditation from a regulating body in architecture. In A8, cultural diversity and social equity states, the diverse needs, values, behavioral norms, physical abilities, and social and spatial patterns that characterize different cultures and individuals, and the responsibility of the architect to ensure equity of access to sites, buildings, and structures. A6 and A8 describe the role of precedence that is in striking contrast to how architectural discipline views the role of canonical works in the play in the construction of an architectural history. Both SPCs outlined by NAB view the role of precedence in a clinical and legal manner as a fundamental aspect of architecture practice in relationship to the ethics of the profession. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Henry Yang. I am here to talk about the authority of history in architecture. Let me start with how German-Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin defines history and historian. Walter Benjamin argues that a historian is not a mere documenter of the past. The historian is, more importantly, an interpretator of the past from the perspective of the present. In this sense, as has been said by some, history is a constellation that present makes with the past. History is not simply the documentation of events and their sequence. It's not a pure chronology. Rather, it is a discourse constructed in the present in relationship to what is inevitably an imperfect reconstruction of the past. Historians construct a discourse through an interpretation of the past and do so in relationship to institutions. And this is not a trivial observation. The construction of historical understanding within the institution then carries an authority that affects practice. For a history to be authoritative, of course, it needs to be evidenced. It needs to have relationship to the truth. What's understood to be a fictional history, though it may be interesting, will not be authoritative. Historians construct the boundaries of architectural discourse by determining what to be included or excluded from the present. Though it may not be immediately obvious, an architectural discourse ultimately gains its authority through a historical understanding. It is interesting to note, and this is itself a bit of a history, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, it was not architects that judged work, but historians. The competitions at Ecole des Beaux-Arts were set and judged by professors of history, not the instructors at the ateliers. Architecture is a unique profession where architectural discipline and profession coexist in architectural education. We can observe that the architectural discipline emerges approximately 550 years ago with the work of Leon Bresta Alberti. However, Architectural profession emerges during the early 19th century with the formation of professional organizations such as the RIBA and the AIA. The history of architecture has been studied as part of the architectural discipline. Looking at current NAB, the National Architectural Accreditation Board, which was founded in 1940, student performance criteria, there is only one section that mentions history. Section A7 states, history and global culture of the parallel and divergent history of architecture and the cultural norms of a variety of indigenous, vernacular, local, and regional settings in terms of their political, economic, social, ecological, and technological factors. This is a marginal address of architectural history at best. In contrast, there are multiple mentions of precedent as pointed out by Garrett previously. Then can we say that history belongs to the discipline but not to the profession of architecture? The tension between the requirements of the discipline versus 
the requirements of the profession is an obvious problem of architecture theory and pedagogy today. It continues to be questioned then, what is the role of history in architectural education? Thank you. I have a clip to start with. I want you to empty your mind. Empty my mind? Empty your mind. Empty my mind. Empty your mind of everything that doesn't have to do with fine dining. Fine dining and breathing. Just got an order from the boss. Dump everything that isn't about fine dining. Everything? Everything. Come on, come on, come on. Trigger, trigger. Delete, delete. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Come on, let's get moving. Hurry up, what do you think I'm paying you for? You don't pay me. We don't even exist. We're just a clever visual metaphor used to personify the abstract concept of thought. One more crack like that and you're out of here. No, please! I have three kids. You are the man. Great. Okay. Uh, would anyone disagree if I said that in order to make architecture, one must be able to think in the abstract? The use of this term has become habitual to many. But what exactly is the abstract, and what does it mean to do abstraction? The university teaches abstraction, promising lifelong benefits from learning to think abstractly. It is so taken for granted that we seldom question what this actually means. The term abstract has slipped into the description of seemingly everything. This ubiquity perhaps hints at something uncomfortable that the world itself is already abstract. In contemporary culture, the word abstract is used all the time. Perhaps this is due to the ascendancy of modern art throughout the 20th century. For example, SpongeBob SquarePants offers a straightforward reference to the abstract concept of thought. And both The Simpsons and Family Guy are known to mention popular abstract artists such as Jackson Pollock. SpongeBob's reference to money solidified my choice in playing the clip before this introduction. Marx presents his labor theories of value as an abstraction necessary to life under capitalism. Every object becomes imbued with an abstract monetary value that is required to bring it into a relationship with other objects. If you can equate a physical item with money, you are doing abstraction. For SpongeBob, this means his abstractions are doing abstraction. Uh, impressive as that may be, uh, it is perhaps not wide enough to help us understand the roots of what we call abstraction. The term has deep origins in metaphysics and, and etymology stretching back into ancient Greece, but was perhaps most directly investigated by philosopher John Locke, who raises distinct qualities of the abstract which may interest us. From an essay concerning human understanding, Locke theorizes abstraction as a step before the making of words. He writes, since all things that exist are only particulars, where do we find the general natures they are supposed to stand for? Words become general by being made the signs of general ideas. And ideas become general by separating from them the circumstances of time and place. By this way of abstraction, they are made capable of representing more individuals than one, each of which having in it a conformity to that abstract idea. So Locke suggests um, abstraction is what comes between the experience of reality and language. It is what allows for the word chair to describe each black metal folding object in this room. It connects my idea um, of chairness with everyone else's. For Locke, our ability to communicate and exchange abstract ideas is the foundation of human civilization. In this context, it is interesting then to consider the provocation of Graham Harmon, Timothy Morton, and others developing object-oriented ontology. The human being isn't the only uh, being capable of abstraction. It is the way all objects interact. <clears throat> 
So, if abstraction is really at the core of what it means to relate to other objects, and the human being has a peculiar and unique way of exchanging abstractions, what does it mean to teach abstraction? Thank you. So uh, with that, I'd like to invite our panelists to our table, and we could bring up the lights. We have a large panel uh, and difficult topics, right? And um, I know some of you came armed with, uh, with, uh, I guess, takes on the problem, you know? And some of you did not. Uh, before, and this is uh, intended to be kind of an unstructured uh, debate, okay? But the only ground rules is to keep returning to these three topics, about history, precedent, and abstraction. And uh, uh, it's also fair game to dispute whether or not these are even important things to talk about, I think. Okay, so that's fair. Uh, before we jump into it, uh, I'm going to uh, enter in with questions and, uh, and try to steer the conversation from time to time if I feel like it's getting a little bit uh, out of control, uh, but, but uh, for the most part, I'd like to be uh, hands off because we have some really interesting people here. So uh, first, I'm going to start by introducing the people on the panel. We have uh, Matt Shaw, who is uh, a journalist, an architectural journalist, and he's currently working at uh, Architects newspaper. And what is your title there right now, Matt? Uh, right. Senior editor. Senior editor. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for coming, Matt. Uh, we have Michael Osman, a uh, recently tenured professor at UCLA. So uh, uh, he won't be going away anytime soon. <laughs> we have uh, uh, Eric Anoyu, who's our coordinator of research here and recent hire in history theory courses here at SciArc, uh, coming to us from the GSD, where he also did his dissertation. Uh, we have Marcin Gao, who uh, uh, I would like to announce uh, here officially will be becoming the coordinator of the Design Theory and Pedagogy program beginning uh, not this year, but uh, the following year in fall 2018. So uh, we're going to hand, hand the baton over to you. Uh, we have Ferda Kolaton, professor of practice at the University of Pennsylvania, principal of SU11 in New York City. And we have Christy Ballier, who's, uh, I, I guess we're on, uh, you're here on loan from uh, Ohio State University, uh, where she is now also officially a tenured professor. So congratulations. Uh, I, I, I've wanted to emphasize a little bit uh, this business about tenure because uh, uh, it is uh, to some degree related to this problem of history and institutionality and authority of institution. So I think uh, that will kind of exist as a kind of sublimation, sublimated topic in our discussion, which maybe we'll return to at some point. Uh, what's at stake in the institutionality of the, the discourses that we're entertaining? Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, I think uh, I'd like to uh, try to avoid the question of abstraction initially, because I think that's a bit of a, a larger territory to cover. Uh, I'd like to start just by uh, inviting one of the panelists to comment on uh, uh, these three uh, student uh, performance criteria as uh, legislated by the NAAB, which uh, accredits schools of architecture. Uh, as uh, Eric Noyu and I uh, discussed with the students, uh, 
uh, last week uh, as we we're preparing for today. Uh, it's, it's quite surprising how little is uh, written in the NAAB uh, matrix with regards to the role of history. Uh, so uh, maybe I could uh, uh, put you on the spot uh, for a second, Eric, to kick this off, because we've already had this discussion. Uh, what's your impression of the kind of absence of uh, thesis about the role of history in the, uh, according to the NAB? I think it's interesting to think about it that, that it's actually, it's not just an absence now, it's an absence that has changed in character over the history of the NAB because we've seen uh, with some of the research from students in this group that, uh, that there have been moments when uh, the NAB's uh, changing requirements were reacted to uh, by like massive curricular changes at, uh, at institutions across the country. and so. Uh, we've seen that every time the NAB revises its requirements in relationship to culture, to history, uh, to precedent, that it's, uh, it sort of changes the, the game board for everyone uh, in these various programs. I think what we can see in the kind of current formulation is a real hesitation to, uh, to take a stand, that uh, there's, there's a lack of conviction about what it means. We can see the um, a downplaying of older rules about um, including things about the non-Western or things about uh, social equity. The, these, these appear, but they appear more in professional uh, categories and not in the requirements that are directed towards uh, the, the teaching of history and theory. So the framing of the meaning of the discipline as a story uh, is something that um, accreditation is taking a, a real step back from engaging with right now. You want? Okay. Um, I think that generally uh, uh, it's a conflict of two professions um, that uh, there's only a recent history of the architectural historical profession in architecture schools. So um, I think what you're seeing probably is an institutional malaise in recognizing the recent uptick in professional the professionalized architectural historian in architecture schools, um, which is to say that people with PhDs are teaching, like Eric and me, um, Marcelin, uh, history to architecture future professionals, and that we're we're we've been professionalized vis-a-vis -vis another profession, and then so it's like a it's a weird Venn diagram that needs to be described, and I think you're right. There's like a a, a fitfulness in the bureaucracy that can't quite articulate two professions coexisting mm. in one institution because it used to be just one profession. Mm. Um, so now, insofar as we're an organized entity with our own form, when we've had forms of publication, but we've had now we even have a, a sense of, uh, let's say, institutional power, say, like Mark Wigley being a dean or Anthony Vidler being a dean, uh, you know people who were historians leading schools of architecture. Um, I think one, uh, maybe it was Henry who said, this used to be the case, and it's the case again, um, or has recently been the case. I think that probably we're seeing a kind of institutional politics that mm. hasn't yet been fully worked out. Mm. Do you see this changing then over time where uh, a professional accreditation body like the NAB will begin to absorb some new criteria uh, legislating the requirement of a historical understanding? Uh, my sense is that NAB is going to go away. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that it's going to be only historians determining that, um, <laughs> that, that there's going to be more power shifted toward PhDs only because there are more and more of them being produced and there's an identi identification of history with knowledge and as much as architecture ever wants to be claimed as a profession as a as more than just a profession or let's say in the absence of professional architects as we see that a diminishing entity we'll see more people claiming to be architects who don't 
who don't enact the mm -hmm. profession of architecture. And so we're going to see a higher and higher value being played. I mean, this is trend. I'm just reading the trends. Mm -hmm. But I think that we're probably going to see less and less interest in the profession in the schools as there are fewer and fewer professionals. And there are more interest in the historians in the schools and so far as we're going to see more and more historians. Mm -hmm. But then, to be just let me throw one little more piece in before I um, try to get the people who don't uh, have PhDs to uh, <laughs> come in on this. Uh, that's actually a kind of a turn back to the origins of the professional, the kind of professional formation of academia seizing control over the professional formation of the field, right? Like the Ecole the, des all the professors who got to decide what the assignments were and give the lectures were the historians. The studio professors weren't professors, they didn't actually get to, te to talk. They, they just taught the students at their ateliers, and they weren't present in the, in the academy. And so, in a way, the model that you're describing is a model where we kind of finally worked our way back to that s situation. Uh, and I think in, in light of that, it's important to remember that the, the existence of PhDs in, in architecture itself is, was, was uh, something that we kind of came up with at architecture schools to make up for the fact that we didn't want to keep using art historians right. for it. And that there was something different about someone whose job was to teach practitioners versus someone whose job was to describe objects and how those objects came to be and what they meant. So I think there's a difference between a practitioner and a professional. Um, I don't know how many of you are AIA members, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so insofar as I'm teaching practitioners, I, I continue to agree mm -hmm. that's my role. Though I was a keynote speaker at the <laughs> AIA convention. That's right. Yes. <laughs> but I, Maybe th I should get an honorary one just for that. I just see the role of being accredited by NAB as, a, as having diminishing value. Um, I, and I actually can say that not because I have tenure, but because I just think that the, the role of the profession in describing what architecture is to itself is it has basically run its course. And I mean, I've basically been, I, I'm just, this is just narrating what David's been telling me. <laughs> <laughs> And so we have to, and I thought the point of this program was to invent what architecture will be uh, after this, the eclipse of the profession. Sure. So we're training people to train people to not be professionals, but to be people who do architecture in any other number of ways. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I mean. I mean, uh, Matt, uh, I just want to, I, I, I suddenly become curious about your perspective on this because you're a journalist uh, kind of surveying the state of architecture today, right? And you're writing on everything from uh, really more kind of general interest, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, you know, studies of, uh, all right, this is the new Renzo Piano building in New York. What do we think of it, you know? And th that's for everybody. To very narrow topics about certain uh, phenomena in uh, media and culture, right? So I I'm just curious, like, uh, it's a noticeable thing for you, isn't it, that there is this kind of schism between the state of the architectural profession and what's happening in schools. Uh, we wouldn't be the first person to observe it. It's been heavily commented on. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what you make of this, uh, about just the state of things here. Um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of a, a broad, like an age-old question, I guess, for architecture, uh, going back to maybe postmodernism when we first the first kind of wave of populists that came along. Um, or not the first, but the, the ones with really that at the core. Um, you know, today it seems like there are a lot of practices that are um, starting to move into sort of interdisciplinary uh, territories. Um, how much that's encouraged by the academy, I'm not sure. Um, there's probably like several different economies for, for young, at least for young practitioners. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the kind of biennial model and economy. Mm -hmm. yes. It's not an art fair, but it's like, <laughs> it's not an art fair, but it's like kind of a you know, different economy. You're not selling your work, but you're like mm -hmm. on display and, and maybe there's somebody else buying parts of your work, buying ideas or something uh, to buy later. Um, and then there's the kind of like everyday economy of houses and small mm -hmm. offices and stuff like that. So um, as far as like, how these things relate to each other, I think, is is really interesting. Like what the different platforms are um, for for practice today, um, and I don't know if there's like a a great answer for this, but um, I, I think you could 
I, and it's hard to speculate, I guess, about this year's Chicago Biennial, but it, to me, I think it'll be an interesting way to compare the first and second biennials because I think it's pretty clear that one of them was about uh, working outside of the discipline, and one of them is like a hyperdisciplinary project. Um, and so it'll be interesting to compare those two models. Mm. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Mm. Well, uh, to some degree it does, because I guess what you're observing is just a lack of clarity about, the, about this. That, yeah. I mean, clearly there's a lot of initiatives at every school to try to establish uh, the next phase of architecture. And for some, it means greater focus and practice. Some, for others, it means doubling down on the discipline. For others, still, it's about crossing the disciplines and inventing new uh, ways of being viable in the economy. Uh, uh, so I think we're, we're just seeing a lot of different uh, activities and, and uh, theories about uh, what happens now. You know? So I think, uh, I mean, if we try to do like a very quick rewind of the tape of the 20th century, you see a kind of gigantic uh, leap towards uh, professionalization. And uh, uh, it probably took decades for that to kind of come to a close. But for the most part, in the, the many flavors of postmodernisms that we've seen, they've all, to some degree, been a kind of attempt to kind of, kind of shut the door on the coffin of this professionalization of a uh, period of modernism, and like multiple times declaring it's over. You know. <laughs> And I don't know if it is over. Uh, I don't know like why it had to be reiterated so many times and why it needed to be said it's over in so many different ways. And the kind of general state of uncertainty that we have right now, uh, which is not necessarily, a, I think, a downer. I mean, I, I, it only sounds like a bit of a downer to say, all right, everything's coming apart. But I actually see it as totally the opposite, that it's incredibly, uh, I don't know, interesting that there are so many uh, possibilities on the table, you know, and that things can be like smart people with talent will be able to capitalize on things and actually have room to establish the direction. So I think uh, they, they go hand in hand, the uncertainty and the possibility, I think. Well, returning to the uncertainty, I think um, something that we recently have been debating here at school was in working through these SPCs, which was actually kind of a really uh, informative but also kind of humorous debate about how something, the terminology that NAB uses, they, you know, they outline the student performance criteria, something we'll say social equity, um, the architect's responsibility to ensure equity of access to sites and structures. and. And so there was a, a huge discussion between the history theory um, curriculum and the design studio curriculum. Where does this belong? Where do we actually locate this? And it is kind of fascinating to me that the criteria are sort of laid out um, for the school, but then it's up to each school, each institution, to decide how these are located. Mm -hmm. Is that a part of a history cu curriculum, or is it something that you would address through ADA regulations. Um, there's no clear answer to that. There's really no clear guideline. And so it's something that is kind of, that we're constructing at the moment uh, as we prepare for the NAB visit. And so I think it, it just points out, like, where do these problems get addressed? Are they addressed simultaneously in different ways in the two curricula? Or, you know, how does this uh, actually play itself no. out? Um, and just for anyone who hasn't had to work on the accreditation of an architecture school, uh, these uh, these requirements that you've heard about so much in this uh, in this so far today are really important. They're the they're the primary thing that gets tested uh, by the the committee of people who are sent to review the school. Uh, you need to be able to demonstrate that you've uh, accomplished each of these things on this list in order to be accredited as an architecture school. And it, failing to do so could uh, in, endanger a school status as a school of architecture at all. Yep. You know, <clears throat> to me in the end, a lot of these questions come down to authority and, and the loss of authority that in architecture. Um, but I think um, 
is, was also part of the debate in the Toronto ACSA conference you're mentioning early on, and I think we touched on the question of the periphery versus the center, at least to me, in ways where um, I, I recall that my, my own participation in it, I was talking about niche profession, right, outside of um, the center, but still something that maintains authority. As, as something that is particular to the field or the discipline. Um, and I think it, one, one of the tendencies um, is not so much about accreditation, but I think a more kind of general uh, tendency um, that I've seen in my own life as an educator in the last 20, 25 years is um, a, a kind of really an undermining of what was an expertise in the field of architecture outside of the practical or the professional, right? And uh, it's interesting uh, in, in terms of the kind of, uh, you know, to, to hear you guys also talk in terms of what the role of history is, but of course it's also to maintain a particular authority to the discipline that can only come from within to a certain degree, right? And that is pushing very hard against uh, kind of a political landscape today of um, cross-disciplinarity, of um, agility in the profession, all those kinds of code words that, in my opinion, at the end, just kind of further undermine <laughs> what our original expertise is. Now, the question is, um, is that just what it is, and we better wisen up and um, find a different way of articulating what our center and our periphery is? Or can we still sort of, um, you know, bring back some of the values or, or let's say markers that had, have the long kind of tradition of the history of architecture and say, no, 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 you know, it's a new world, but we can still, we are still the best people um, to teach this, to understand it and to practice it. And honestly, I don't know what the answer is. I know what I want, but I don't know if that's <coughs> the answer. Um, but I mean, I don't know, I'd be curious if, if you guys feel the same way. I think there's certainly, the, the whole notion of, of the, of the cross-disciplinary approach, for instance, to me, always works out in favor of the other discipline. Or maybe not always, but most of the time, right? And that leads me to the question, you know? I mean, it's, it's not a politically correct question to say, hey, I don't want to be, you know, cross-disciplinary. But at the end of the day, what if, if that diminishes our own expertise in the way how we bring it to the table, how do we react to that? But I just I feel like um, expertise is a is a is a term that you would use as a professional. So, you, um, and and uh, as opposed to say somebody who belongs to a discipline, which is to say like of a university department or something like that. Um, so I I for one have was very strange to hear in the '90s people talking about refining our expertise, and yet not being professionals. Right, like that, I, I couldn't understand that. It's sort of mm -hmm. a sort of a sense of false consciousness. So there was like a sense that if you became expert enough in software or something like this, that you would define yourself a kind of new profession, right? Because of the, exha the incipient exhaustion of the sort of sense after postmodernism, of the, the, the lack of traction and authority that the profession seemed to have, that you weren't getting good feeds, that you weren't getting, you know, that all the things it was meant to do, that it wasn't defining you as a creative. Like the whole point of a profession was to differentiate you from a builder, right? Mm -hmm. Their brute labor, your mental labor. And it wasn't working anymore because you were actually being a professional meant being a brute, a brute, you know? And so all these people kind of gathered around expertise in lieu of the profession, which is a weird kind of mistaken identity of expertise as something that's going to save us from the profession, when it's the thing that the profession has always identified itself with. So you're just, as you say, moving your disciplinary home from, from architecture to software. That's a problem, right? So the one thing that the his, historians always advocated was, why would you want to be an expert? Right? Like, what's that about? Why wouldn't you want knowledge? Why wouldn't you prefer to be part of an, a knowledge economy? instead of like investing yourself in software and fabrication and just becoming another brute. So, <laughs> yeah, that, I, th I think I was, that's what I was, I was gonna say as well, it's like um, architectural knowledge, uh, let's say from the purest uh, 
sense in what you guys are talking about becomes this disciplinary expertise that's, that never exists autonomously from you know, other professions or other disciplines. Um, so cross-disciplinarity, I don't think, means like, oh, you need to go and work with like filmmakers or something, but like maybe you're, you know, just uh, how is that knowledge then applied to mm -hmm. situations where it's outside of itself? Because th I think there's maybe only one place where it's historians making architecture with historians for historians, and that's in, in the academy, which, um, I don't know, to me is like a specific thing that has a value, but it, for me, architecture gets really exciting when that hardcore knowledge meets outside, outside knowledge, and that's where but, yeah, I don't think it's anti-intellectual. No, just but it's weird because I don't see that as interdisciplinary. I see that as practice. I see that as applied yeah. knowledge. Like that is that's a theory. So like when you have to take what you know and you have to apply it to the world, which is generally not architecture, it's either film or advertising or whatever real estate. That's not architecture. But you have to apply your architectural knowledge to that field of other forms of practice and expertise. Then you're exerting yourself in one form or another, and. So, which is to say, like, why invest in software when someone else knows it better, mm -hmm. right? Oh, don't, you know, get to know it enough that you can kind of dialogue well, with them or whatever. You know, if we, uh, if, if we can give the example of uh, software, like, uh, I think it's a kind of easy thing, yeah. you know, to say, all right, that's stupid. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, I think there are other versions of that where it's a little bit more difficult yeah be so clear cut, like for example, uh, somebody that spe specializes in ecological engineering, for example, mm -hmm. like uh, becoming a uh, lead certified expert in sustainable systems, right? It, it's, it's the same kind of uh, thing, you know, of being, becoming an expert in a kind of subset of the practice, mm -hmm. right? And to perhaps the detriment of a more kind of uh, history-based uh, idea of the expertise. That is, uh, I, I think one of the premises here uh, I was intrigued by with uh, the way Henry wrote this was um, that uh, history uh, is connected to, say, how authority is constructed. So mm -hmm. uh, those of us, uh, like at the school, that uh, would have a strong interest, say, in the discipline of architecture, uh, it's associated with our knowledge of the history of architecture. And to some degree, it's uh, kind of we're relying on the historians uh, to write that history and construct that discourse for us. You know? So I, I think there are different forms of authority. I mean, it could be authority based on a kind of technical knowledge. It could be authority based on a kind of legislative knowledge, like I'm a contract expert, right? Uh, <laughs> And it could also be uh, uh, authority based on kind of knowledge of the field. Like I have a lot of connections to people, right? That could get you done, right? Uh, but, but then uh, the most interesting one, I think, is the authority based on our knowledge of what's happened in the past of architecture, which is a very contested ground, as we know. You know? Now, I, I know Christy, uh, I, I last, kept, last week, you told me you're a disciplinarian. Right, and <laughs> you're more on the side of that, but you also practice, and you are also in the last Venice Biennale too. You know, you mentioned that. So I'm, I'm curious to get your perspective on this debate about the, the discipline mm -hmm. and its relationship to the profession. Like you, you, you jump back and forth over the fence. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, I think y based on our conversation, you said. I think you're, you're, that's quite a disciplinary <laughs> comment. <laughs> so I think you, you were, I don't know that I identify with one more than the other, but it, I think based on our conversation and the thing that I was prioritizing in that conversation, I think you were like, wow, you're such a disciplinarian in the way that I was thinking about virtual reality at that mm -hmm. moment or something. Um, I think what's, um, for me, kind of interesting about this jump back and forth between the two um, and why I think it's important, at least for me, uh, as a, like a designer, let's say, to kind of position myself back like, between those two worlds of practice and the discipline um, is because I think it's important that I feel like my expertise is to, is whenever possible, be aware of what I'm working on. Like what problem am I working on? Right? And that could be a very practical um, problem of trying to solve something um, that's sort of practice related or trying to find a particular materiality or a texture or you know, something that has like a lot of um, 
kind of practice aspect to it. Other parts could be um, what, what am I working on and when have other people worked on that? How have they worked on that? And how can I sort of stand on the shoulders of um, how they approached that problem? Um, and so I think, I don't know, I think for me that's why it's really important um, to walk between the two. Because I think if I um, only am kind of solving the problems of practice, like how am I going to do this, um, it, I think it loses a little bit of potency um, if I don't also sometimes be like, well, what is it that I'm working on in a larger sense? How is this problem connected to um, the previous problem that I was working on or the one that my peer might be um, thinking about? How are, I don't know, I find it very valuable to kind of look at like the nuance of how someone else might be working on something very similar. Um, now, what's interesting in the way you're framing this is I think um, uh, uh, Essentially what you're saying is uh, the problems that are worth working on uh, are disciplinary ones. I, yeah. well, I, because it's the discipline that then defines the problems, right? Because that's how I know what I'm working on. I'm working on these problems you know, um, as yeah, it relates I mean, to I the discipline. Right? Again, I yeah. think this is where I, I'm more, I think things that are worth working on have probably been worked on before. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily think like, oh, in order for me to feel like I'm, like the time I'm spending is valuable, I need to attach it to the discipline. I think it just inherently is attached to the discipline if, if you start to think about, well, who's worked on this before and how have they I think, I think solved it? It's weird, we haven't really defined this discipline thing. I mean, mm. I, for me, yeah. I, 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 my, your students know this very well. I, I think of the discipline as an economy. So if you're working on it, you're working on it because the discipline told you to. It's not, beca it's not because you're identifying it as a disciplinary problem. And has, you have very little agency over identifying things with disciplinary, let's say, problems, as you might call them. Discipline puts you to work. It's the way in which capitalism dealt with the university. As it said, we're going to make you disciplined through disciplines and you're gonna work on them and work on the problems. And then sometimes those problems were given value and then we worked on them. But don't you think this <laughs> argument <laughs> is, uh, but don't you think uh, the kind of, uh, I, I don't know, the backup, yeah. you know, when the evidence is delivered yep. to say this is the discipline, yep. right, coming from, say, the institution yep. through the economy, uh, the historians are deployed, really, yeah. to give the authority. Yeah. Right? Okay. To say this is a legitimate discipline. Yeah. Right? Like uh, we can uh, invent any discipline we want, just make up imaginary preposterous ones, right? But without authority, I mean, that's not a real discipline. Right? No matter how much political will might actually be there to turn it into a segment of the economy, it, it's not going to happen unless there's authority behind it. Right, that, I, so I think cru history plays a crucial role there. That's right. I mean, yeah. when you think about what historians do for nation states, they tell the story of the nation state. And, and so there's always like the presidential, there's always the sort of president, and then there's the historian of the president, and then there's the president's library. And then so history is there to enact power, mm -hmm. and is it there to give authority to things. I mean, and that's why you would want them in your institution mm -hmm. to begin with. I mean, I never understood why people were like, oh, we don't want historians in our institution. They, why? You, that's what, exactly what you want. If you want to be president, you need your historian, right? Like, <laughs> so, like, that's a crazy, that's crazy thinking, you know, like, um, so insofar as the, the historians get to decide, as it's, it appears, meh, they're more or less telling the institution, this is what power wants. And power, this is what the institution can deliver. It's a little bit more like a kind of matchmaking between power, like, which is basically often capital, and institutions, like, so okay, this is why you would pay your tuition to go here, because in here, this is where they teach you how to do this, that power wants. So, you know. Like, but, but you can't just invent a, a history. I mean, that's what Stalinist Soviet Union tried to do, but just by rewriting history, and you mm -hmm. can't do that, because uh, it, it's not enduring. 
like uh, it, it doesn't have enough of a relationship to say truth or what actually happened or mm -hmm. the actual meaning of things or the enduring significance of events and so on. So like uh, you can't just merely deploy historians as a kind of generic weapon to you know, give momentum to whatever initiative it there actually is some resistance, yeah. isn't there, Absolutely. right? I, I can't believe I'm saying this to a historian. <laughs> no, you, I mean, you're I, the historian there. No, but I, I, you, you know, history is weaponized often. Mm -hmm. And then the, the question, I mean, they used to call that theory. And then, um, I actually got that from Sylvia. Right. <laughs> but, uh, and, and in, insofar as it was capable of doing that, being weaponized for the sake of an institution, it became theory. But insofar as it resisted that, it remained his history as a form of sort of I don't know if it, what you called pure knowledge. Right? You know, does it really resist it? Like, when does it resist it? Well, we don't want our institutions to be NAB accredited, say. Like, I wouldn't. Has like, it, I'd yeah. advocate against accreditation. <laughs> That, well, I think there's a limitation on how far his joints go. I second that. Yeah. <laughs> I second that. Um, you know, uh, Michael, it's, it's also interesting because I remember, again, I, if I go back to the 90s when the computer thing started, for instance, um, there was a, a real, on the part of the designers and the design faculty, there was a, a real effort to push historians away. Yeah. Um, because they stood in the way through their economy, the one you're pointing out, in this sort of idea of progressive um, search for novelty or something, right? And um, I remember this very well at Columbia. This was a discussion for yeah. many years um, where professors, when I was a student and then later when I taught there as well, where we were basically saying, well, don't read that because it will <laughs> give you all kinds of weird ideas. And um, we are now with this new kind of technology, we are remaking the world. And then the historians can come and just like spin it around or whatever they want to do. It. <laughs> and I think this is to a certain degree, and I was totally on board with that back then. Right? You know, I was young and clueless, but um, energetic and clueless. Um, and then later, after, after a certain period of time, it's really interesting because you realize, and I go back to the center periphery issue here, right? That, that, some, that the, the project started to lack the economy <laughs> through which you could actually understand and talk about them in ways that were outside of the esoteric circle of a bunch of crazy people who just do weird soft image renderings. And um, to me, that was a really interesting moment, the recognition of that, right? I mean, what, what, what the role of history is within the disciplinary, you know, outside of just understanding what the past is. That was my first education, right? In Germany, history meant you just understood what the past was all about, had your precedence, and you moved forward with a kind of modernist ideology. But I think in, in the sort of the digital um, project, these things for some time were really kind of suspended. And I think there was this sort of kind of real opposition. And I don't know if, ha if that has ever really eased back or off. It seems mm. that tension is still very strongly part of you know, our institutions, at least the ones we are basically operating. You know, because you mentioned uh, 90s, late 90s Columbia, mm. um, famously the Paperless Studios Columbia, uh, three of us were actually there during this kind of period. Mars was also there mm -hmm. more in the, you were there in 2000, no, late 90s. I was right? there 97, 98. 97, yeah. yeah. So like, uh, I, I, this why I think it is kind of an important project to try to develop a history of pedagogies and schools, a history of institutions associated with architecture because uh, the history will, sh will begin to reveal that there was some, some odd things about the circumstances of Bernard Schumi's Columbia. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, Columbia, which was already kind of prepped for a kind of countercultural agenda because it was also a kind of sister school of Nanterre and you know, there were protests in 68, mm -hmm. you know, right after May 68, and it was already kind of prepped you know, to some degree. Uh, there are a lot of people sympathetic to the situationist movement and teaching in other departments, like in Complet and so on. So I think uh, Bernard Schumi, who was deeply sympathetic to this and uh, was a kind of participant in 
the, the kind of hiccup in French society, uh, was teaching at the AA, then at Cooper Union, and then I think uh, more or less kind of naturally found a home at Columbia with uh, his sympathies to the situation as international and everything that happened in late 60s France. So there was already a kind of a fertile ground for a project of uh, alienating uh, uh, like the mainstream of production. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, okay, it's interesting. It's not an accident, but it's interesting to take an animation tool and misuse it to alienate both the tool and architecture. You know? Now this was never like, explicitly understood during that time. You know, but it, it was quite striking to me that we actually had a kind of uh, CAD department you know, that was run by Eden Muir, who had absolutely no interest in what we would call the disciplinary problems, uh, had no interest in coming to reviews or what was happening in the studios and who the studio instructors were. He was only interested in producing the perfect uh, CAD software. And of course, it had to be one developed by him, right? And, but it was a complete uh, kind of dominance of some idea of uh, technical expertise becoming the primary focus. So it, it's ironic, those of us that were in the studios, the design faculty and those interested in design that were kind of alienating these tools or misusing these tools, were ironically more on the side of uh, ultimately people like Frampton and Tafuri and people who were critiquing the society of production and all this and interested in culture and so on. So it was a very interesting moment, I think, uh, for just the technologization and the emergence of another kind of expertise pos possibly or how that failed and so on. Well, this is, you give a great example of why I think that why we can always say that the authority of expertise Will never is always going to be trumped by the authority of discourse, and it's not just history. It's anybody who can who can set the discourse, mm. because expertise is always expertise in a field that's been that's been defined, mm -hmm. and discourse gets to define what the field is. So we, discourse can pull the the rug out from under expertise at any time by redefining the rules through which expertise is defined. Like expertise doesn't get to change itself. You like you get better and better at being an expert because the rules are set and you know what constitutes that expertise. Mm -hmm. And so history, but also theory, whatever that, that means at different times, mm -hmm. and uh, the role of the, of the practice in, in participating in the discourse and not in, in, the, in, a, in an expertise of profession totally agree. Uh, is, is together uh, c constitute that, that discursive authority, which, which can always be deployed to, to redistribute uh, the limitations of expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean, that history there is only important. It's, it's almost not that important at the beginning of that. History is just the one that gets to keep on curating mm -hmm. the ongoing uh, uh, set of assumptions that, uh, that the discourse has decided to accept. I totally, I mean, I can't agree more with that. Like, I think that what probably you were experiencing was the incipient rise of design discourse. Yeah. Um, and I think we, don't, we haven't yet settled into what that is. Mm. We don't really know. And I think that the, the weird thing was reading Assemblage and seeing that there were people who were teaching design studios and writing texts mm. um, was uh, like uh, an amazing thing for me as a student. Uh, not be, because I saw it as a legitimate form of, of discourse right. and, and giving power mm. to what we were working on at, in a scholarly fashion mm. in a studio environment without the need for historical explanation, right? Mm. Just mm. purely um, like another form of pure knowledge, mm. design discourse. But we didn't, I don't think anybody was ever trained in how to do it. You know? <laughs> you know what's interesting about that is even though it may fall outside of the practice of history defined as a profession, like professional standards of how to do history, yeah. well, footnotes, et cetera, right? <laughs> now, uh, sure, like the people who are writing an assemblage that were designers, architects, right, constructing a discourse and I, I would say writing more than designing, mm -hmm. you know, during that time. Right. Even though uh, they're outside of the, maybe the rules of how you write history, all of their discourse were uh, informed by a history of all the projects that they have seen, <laughs> right? 
which then made relevant certain problems, maybe, to, that are worth working on at that moment within what's av available. You know, so even though it may not be a history in maybe a legit sense, uh, it still was very much constructed out of a historical understanding, I think. But there was also yeah. a huge shift to the natural sciences. I mean, in terms of some of the models, like specifically with Greg Lynn, I remember he was teaching a contemporary theories of morphology, which was the seminar that accompanied his studio. And in that course, we were looking at Darcy Wentworth Thompson. We were looking at models from science, Bateson. Um, and so for me, that was a real shift as well, having come previously from my undergrad education uh, at University of Virginia, where it was very traditional historical precedent. I mean, we really began with that at Columbia at that time. The word precedent almost became like a dirty word. It was like you don't look at an architectural precedent, anything but. And so I think we've moved again away. I think we've come full circle in a sense. And I think there is a whole, this current generation um, of students who are very invested in kind of acquiring the knowledge of history and becoming conversant with historical uh, precedent again, I would say. I just, I no, I totally just agree. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's what I me what I meant also in the beginning of, of just what I said before. Because <clears throat> I mean, you would the precedent was some kind of weird animal mm -hmm. or weather patterns <laughs> or you know, you know just um, you know, something you would read out of a Kelly <laughs> book out of order, you know, th those kinds of things. And um, I mean, it, but it's interesting, David, what you say because I mean, we would. I remember, you know. Bernard would come and sit in the back and listen to reviews that we would have with Greg and you know make his little notes. And um, I, I totally believe that in retrospect at least it becomes very clear that he saw in a lot of um, the things that were going on during that time some kind of a continuation of the 68 project, right? Yeah, I think um, and, and in that something um, that was opposing the institution, right? Even though you are you know, Ivy League Columbia, and then here you are, right? And you just sort of find another way to undermine the kind of institutional um, progression of an architectural education. Right? And I, I think that's actually quite interesting in retros retrospect, but I agree totally with what you say. Like, mm -hmm. during the time, it was, again, this sort of, you know, in order for the profession to reinvent itself after all the mistakes of postmodernism and deconstructivism, um, we now get our own modernist tool, which will allow us to sort of enter a new stage of enlightenment, right? I mean, we were kind of really pushing for that, and that's why that scientific idea was so important, right? So, because it would... I, I, I it, wanted to just uh, ask both of you, you know, Fred and Marshall, and uh, why, why what do you think, in retrospect, precedent was so out of bounds? in the design methodologies of the studios. Because I think, I mean, I think it's coupled with what you were saying about the software, because I remember that as well. We were taking these inverse kinematic tools, which would be used for animators for joint movement, and trying desperately to figure out how on earth, as an architect, can we make this useful? And sometimes it just failed. Sometimes it was, you know, you would produce all of these models. Sometimes. We'd have the pinups. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I remember surfaces. Oh, thank God, <laughs> and then, I mean, strangely enough, years later, coming back to, you know, I was sitting in the robot house here a few mm -hmm. years ago and talking with them about how the inverse kinematic mm -hmm. logics, again, now are like implemented in a completely different way um, in the design workflow. And I think it was really removing precedent was about saying, okay, if we don't rely on convention or things that are sort of known quantities that we will become more inventive. I think it was a way of forcing us to think in a different way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, I, I, so that's the question is like if we return full circle and say, okay, precedent is you know first and foremost on the table, and maybe this has to do with the difference between a core curriculum and upper level option or vertical studios uh, where those things get played out. But I, I mean, I would imagine that a student would be really empowered if they did have that historical knowledge, if they did have the knowledge of precedent, and then, and that's probably why that was happening in the AMARC II program, because it was a program for people who already had been educated with that solid foundation. And so I think the idea was, okay, move away from everything you think architecture is, and you have to now 
really posit what architecture might be in the future. So really kind of pushing beyond mm -hmm. the known. Yeah, I, was, I guess I was wondering, and sorry if this, uh, I was kind of wondering if, if in that aspect you kind of think history can, can be a problem, like can be sort of a specter that uh, underlays this stuff and keeps coming back maybe in ways that maybe it shouldn't. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking about today, like, or I guess as what you guys were saying, you know, sometimes the most interesting moments in architectural history are when, when we, like, reject it. Like, <coughs> the early modernists, in some ways early, more radical postmodernists, um, and then the, the digital sort of thing. And, um, you know, I'm wondering if now we're not seeing, I don't know, like, a return of history in, in, in a way, not necessarily that the return of history is bad, but the way it's returning is maybe not so helpful mm. that it's like that it's a little bit like we're in the Philip Johnson Pomo phase of, of history where it's not like being utilized in a way that is is always so useful. Well, the circulation of images and documents and the, mm. the way in which the not before to know a precedent like when I went to school, you would literally trace plans and you would literally redraw the building or you know, now in some studios remodeling to get to know, okay, exactly how that building works. Um, and almost to have to kind of work through the problem of to draft that building, I mean, it was still hand drafting. <laughs> so, but now, you know, everything is just, the, the, the images circulate, so when students do precedent research, often things are just being pulled and placed next to one. So it's a very different way of knowing that object of even of experiencing the drawing in a full in a folio edition versus some kind of low res jpeg and i don't think i'm not lamenting that but i think it does make us maybe have to rethink how do we grapple with precedent like you know because we're transitioning to the use of the word precedent so this is uh, i'm jumping into the seize on the opportunity because you mentioned history and you respond with precedent i think uh, this is a pretty interesting uh topic uh, is uh, like when I, I, I'm very curious to find out when the word precedent actually first starts to be used you know because I can't imagine uh, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts even in French like kind of such a word being used with uh, juridical connotation kind of legislative Peter connotation Collins. it's Peter Collins yeah uh, Peter Collins uh, mm -hmm. uh, writes a book on architectural judgment, uh, which he compared, I mean, it's, it, this isn't the origin point, mm. but it's a moment of self-consciousness about mm. that term. When was it? In the 70s. Mm. Um, right at the moment at which they're making MR programs, Peter Collins writes this book and he says, look, architects have precedents like the law. Mm. So it, mm. it's, it's almost like, exactly like, being kind of cribbed from Oh, I mean, the it's an explicit law, you know? thing, yeah. and he goes yeah. through cases to show how there's yeah. an affinity between the two. And it is a moment of a reorientation of the profession from architects being creatives to architects being Well, see, at this point, it begins to make a lot of sense why we have juries. Yeah. Right? Where uh, we, we joke that we're putting students on trial when yeah. we have the public jury. Yeah. But it's not a joke. It, it, <laughs> it is quite literally that. Because you're not dropping off your work and uh, you take it off the wagon, put it in the dark room, and goodbye, and the professors mark it and put up the grades later. You know, no, the student stands in front of the jury, and there's a kind of judgment being rendered. You know, I, I mean, that's like the we know it's just theater uh, to some degree, but uh, the theater has meaning too. You know, if we deconstruct it a little bit, so I think uh, uh, the use of the word precedent, I think it goes with the format of the jury, yeah. right? And I think it should be quite striking that uh, something from the legal profession is brought into architecture. And I think an interesting question is why? And, I, I mean, and, because, of that, it, <laughs> and because of that, I think it's kind of a distinct problem from the problem of history. Yeah, that's, yeah. I was gonna yeah. say, judge, uh, it's funny that mm. Collins called it architectural judgment because for, for Kant, this is my, what I prepared, um, uh, for Kant, in order to produce a judgment, you need to have abstraction. Mm. Um, you need to be able to know what, how you know. Um, and, uh, and for Collins, judgment was based on precedent. 
<laughs> um, and it's a shift. So I, I see that. So I basically see precedent as history without abstraction. Hmm. Um, and uh, and and what's interesting about uh, about your, the inter the interest in the students in precedent is and and its ease probably in the '90s is the moment at which precedent becomes too easy, hmm. and is in a, a moment at which they're moving to natural sciences because there the abstraction is explicit, right? So not enough abstraction in history. Let's find it in Bateson. Um, and, and because it's difficult to mm -hmm. absorb, as opposed to, say, Campo Marzio, right? OK, Stan Allen just did that. You know, like, no problem. Like, he, it took him no time at all. And there's a kind of maybe like the transformation from the card catalog to the Avery Index, which goes online in the 90s in the basement of Columbia's architecture. Maybe all of that is the technical substrate for moving to Bates and, and it reverse kinematics and all this sort of esoteric uh, in the software, natural sciences, and so forth like that. Now history's hard again, yeah. it seems to me. Because, you know, you just check andrewkovacs.com or whatever and you get, <laughs> whatever you want. Um, it's, also, it's also, I mean, I think, to, in a way, it's almost simpler than that, I think. It, yeah. It's a kind of appropriation of a precedent to the technology's preference mm -hmm. of how form structure organization is being generated. So obviously with computation, uh, or maybe not obviously really, because it can do so many different things, but um, you know, the, what seemed to be the most interesting is the thing that moves and grows and changes, right? So all obviously characteristics you find not so much in Palladio, but you will find in some kind of worm that just moves around, right? Um, so it, I, I think it comes, comes down to, to, to that as well. I mean, the, the inverse kinematic tool is one of proportional movement, right? Um, why were we using soft image? I mean, Greg, you know, famously, like in his first paper that said, you're not gonna use form Z because that's based on XYZ Euclidean space. You are going to use soft image because it's based on UV space, right, topology. Um, I, I think at that point, the precedent of, <clears throat> you know, whatever, as I said, Palladio, Salvio, or anything, or modernism, was just not the right thing to look at, right? It wasn't really an architecture, and even, I don't know, Kiesler wasn't the right thing either, even though it may have looked like the right thing to certain people, but it wasn't. So the precedent, I think, then moved towards a different kind of field because that's where we could find you know, simulation, movement, um, transformation, metamorphosis, and all those kinds of other qualities that we were then bringing sort of back and reflecting on the projects that we were developing, you know, with software like Maya later on and software Marshall. Well, I mean, um, the people that really rose from the, kind of came out of that space race, like who's gonna be the first one to do a great project uh, using these tools, right? And, hmm. The ones that emerged out of that were the ones that brought some degree of architectural historical understanding mm -hmm. to the tools, mm -hmm. like, like Greg did. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did it probably better than anybody. Mm -hmm. Like uh, just that comment about XYZ to UV, I think it takes tremendous understanding in the history of architecture to understand the significance of that. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, he was also yeah. the first one who wrote two books, by the way, more yeah. or less. Mm -hmm. to put those yeah. ideas together. I mean, so I think uh, it's, it's not to be underestimated to, in the process of constructing a new discipline, maybe, the role that the historical understanding plays. You know, and you He's just a very, he has like an abstract mind. Like mm. when you, and I'm sorry. Okay. You, like the way in which, so for Greg, his, there's no difference between reading Bates and, and reading Rowe. Like those two things, for him. I, I had him as a studio critic too later, ninety nine, mm -hmm. and I remember the feeling like there wasn't a, there was an, an, an indescribable uh, sort of uh, like very lateral move between different forms of intellectual. Well, Bateson production. is used to critique row, so it, so he brings but them they're not the different same for him. Space I mean, how could you? To... I mean, for me as a student who read row in college and then 
trying to read that against Bates and felt like, what are you doing? It's like it's like <laughs> so, like a DJ who's like mixing, you know, rap and classical. This <laughs> <laughs> doesn't go. You Christy, know, like, you want never to worked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, I've been. I think ever since the when the, the students were going through and defining precedent and history in their thinking, I was like, and, and maybe you bringing up too with the when designers were really starting to create a discourse that was like different than history. I mean, I think that um, designer, like the way a designer accumulates their knowledge of history is I mean, obviously very different than the way a historian accumulates their um, knowledge of history and the hierarchy that they put on things. And I would say it comes back to and um, the fact that designers and why I think it's important to have some, at least for me, to have some aspect of practice as a designer who's also teaching because I think I accumulate my understanding, my like, um, like uh, applied understanding of history when I'm working on problems that then I need to reach into those projects that I maybe learned about in a history course, but I learn about them completely differently when I'm now looking at um, a Lutchen's problem because I'm interested in levels. Right, And then all of a sudden you start to look at 10 projects, something like Lutchen's, which would be considered something you learned about in history class, but then also an image that you find from an elevator company who is interested in a, you know, a pneumatic change from level to level or something. I don't know. Maybe this gets back to like Bateson and Rowe. I think when you're really working on something as a designer, the way you use precedent, the way you develop expertise on that thing at that particular moment is like very different than the expertise you would learn if you were learning about a building or a particular scientific method um, in, through the lens of a historian who's trying to like fully put it in context. You are actually, in fact, learning about that building out of context. And you're only, you're like bracketing what it is about that method or building or experience that you're actually going to pull from to now like put towards the thing you're working on. Mm. And I, I don't know, I think as a design prof like teacher, I think it's really important to like that there isn't this center that you talked about early on. I think you, you would agree that like that it's like as a designer, you're developing your own kind of expertise in your own historical hierarchy. But I think we should be clear that the practice of history is, is much more about abstraction than it is about precedent. Like it, history, history, to become a historian, you can't, precedent is almost irrelevant, but abstraction is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. And so in the same way that I think that abstraction gives us the tools to question process and precedent gives you kind of uh, pieces on a game board. Like we, we need the kind of tools to, to organize the process and that's like, and that, that kind of interpretation is where, I mean, not in Germany. In Germany, it's just about precedent. But, uh, <laughs> but in, 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 uh, in civilized in countries, it's about, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's about uh, the quite, uh, being able to interpret that material and, and comprehend some version of meaning out of it more than it is about uh, following kind of the precedence of other so people's. It almost sounds like you're pointing out that uh, like you would dispute uh, uh, using the, the word history then in this kind of sad state of affairs uh, you might be describing that. Like, a, like a, it sounds very similar to, I think, back when we were in school, me and Ferda, and uh, it, it was coming on the heels of uh, historical POMO, you know, and all of us in school, that was not cool. You know, uh, if you were, you wouldn't be caught dead doing that kind of work in the studio, right? Even though it was still very much in, being built, you know, all around us, you know, still rolling, you know, and, but it seemed maybe uh, one, one way it was talked about already is it seemed too easy, but uh, maybe also uh, not useful or productive because it seemed like just kind of grabbing at uh, things that maybe looked like history to give it maybe uh, false legitimacy, whereas there's something else behind the signifier. There was, yeah, there was a time when, uh, in the, I guess in the early 90s, when the practice FAT started looking at um, some of their, uh, they started looking at postmodernism exactly because of what you were talking about. And they said that the thing that was the most interesting to them about it was its 
I'd quote them, toxic unfashionability. And so they would go to the used bookstores and get all these used books and because they were the cheapest books. <laughs> and, and that became their like catalog of what they were going for. And that was a specific moment in time, I think, where that works. Mm -hmm. But um, it was, it was, a, it was a, I think it was an interesting uh, sort of loaded history that was, uh, mm -hmm. or not history, but like, pre I mean, it was precedent in like the most purest sense, like taking and just copying these buildings and putting like different tiles mm -hmm. on them or something. I'm, there is such a sublimated form of abstraction where you're, mm -hmm. where you are using the irony of cheapness and ugliness and fashionlessness as a medium. Mm -hmm. So like it actually, it's not that it, it's not that it's, um, I think you've characterized it as having a limited time span of, of its existence. I think that that's probably not true. You could probably continue that project ad infinitum, it just takes a heightened level of attention to how to maintain the uh, abstraction in mm. that milieu mm. and not to fall back into the easy, cheap, ugly. Um, because, and, and so actually it's a much harder practice to sustain interest in and much harder practice to sustain probably employability and you know, like you frustrate so many audiences by maintaining your abstraction from what is easy and cheap and ugly, um, and that frustration I know it develops, and 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 probably that's what the economy moved away from them, brief for their their brief uh, flirtation with the kind of uh, with success. But I think I think it it could continue, and I don't know why you wouldn't you know work on you know. Greg's Cardiff Opera or whatever. Uh, if you're fat now, like if you could do a new fat, it would be like that. You'd have to take really bad digital projects and redo them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay, somebody's God. gonna do that. Now. But, <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> I think there's a. I think there's probably because of that. Uh, because of the toxic unfashionability of it. I think there's probably some. Uh, the desire for that, I think, mm. with, with young practices today. Well, but the desire is about the uh, desire to have something a little more authentic than the crap that seems so <laughs> trivial now, right? I mean, yeah, and yeah. maybe outside of yeah. what we're told to do, mm. like, uh, there's like a lot of, I don't know, there was a, mm. a possible mediums conference, I think, brought together a lot of people that... Organized were, by Christie? By <laughs> Christie's <laughs> possible mediums conference. <laughs> <laughs> Brought together a lot of very diverse practices that were sort of under this umbrella of, I mean, you could maybe speak more to that, but what, was, what did you see as the kind of like defining characteristic of those, of those practices? Um, I mean, now I feel like uh, just repeating what I said earlier, but I think that uh, what linked a lot of those practices together was that they were, um, they were all kind of pretty conscious of what they were working on, what the hierarchy in their practice was at that particular moment, what medium they were kind of prioritizing, right? So the idea of calling it possible mediums was that it wasn't this idea, like these practices were not about just creating something out of, the, that was completely unrelated, let's say, to the discipline, but it was that most of them could attach themselves like, you know what, I am sort of prioritizing drawing and representation in what we're doing, but oftentimes they each had a, like a nuanced qualifier, right? So I was interested in projection and drawing, or I'm interested in, at the time, you know, models, um, in their role of abstraction, but I'm interested in like active, like how they act, how they're activated, how they're, um, how they move, how they might have aspects of kinetics to them, or things like um, you know texture. Was you know people would, you know there would be a moment in their practice where they were really just looking at how they could kind of amplify that quality of of their practice and sort of stand on the shoulders of. Um, kind of materiality in architecture or models as, as a means of abstraction in architecture or drawing as a mean you know I think that that's what sort of linked them they, they weren't necessarily just tinkering away not interested in a connection to the discipline but it was more they were interested in defining sort of a um, like a qualifier 
that sort of made kind of like a sub-genre of what they Actually, were working no. on? Um, uh, I've been very interested in the possible mediums, uh, events, and projects, you know, for a number of years. And, and I just thought it was interesting to just track what uh, the most talented people of a generation that are starting to be empowered by universities, because you're all getting you know, early tenure track jobs and things like that. Uh, what, what are they doing? You know, and how are they formulating what is this they're doing? Uh, what, what's very striking to me is even though most of the emphasis, I think, was put on the, the disciplinary, and I think granted loosely defined, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of a, a maybe implicit desire to recover certain forms of architectural knowledge that got kind of obliterated by inverse kinematics and you know, bouncing balls and particle systems or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So uh, in this move to recover then, uh, say maybe a dying or neglected or uh, previous discipline, right? Uh, because after all, you have to recover it. I mean, why, why did it have to be recovered, you know? And then it gave birth to what is lovingly referred to as neo-postmodernism. You know, projects that are then identified as that. And those of uh, the people that constructed that uh, refused that, uh, that, ma that mantle. Say, no, that's like the last thing we wanted to do, right? But uh, it's interesting that the work is being ident identified as such, right? So it's, it's a very interesting, uh, uh, I think, case study in the operation of history and precedent in uh, the most recent past. And then uh, uh, maybe you know, the word abstraction was invoked a couple of times, you know. And I think uh, uh, maybe it's time to like, take this on a little bit as a difficult topic. But I, I think it's not unrelated because, after all, all of the projects were deeply abstract. Know, and perhaps it always is un until it's, it's instantiated through building, putting it back into the circumstances of time and space. So in that sense, I understand the, your emphasis on the value of practice. Mm -hmm. Like uh, earlier, you emphasized it's really important to do stuff, mm -hmm. right? But uh, going back to the earlier way it was talked about, abstraction was the thing that's dislocated from time and space. Uh, I forget who said that exactly, but, but to instantiate it back and uh, put it back into a circumstance of time and space is a kind of movement away from abstraction then, possibly. You know? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm still processing the you think the possible medium shook out neo postmodernist I, I don't know that I, I, I don't I don't know that I agree yeah, uh, well like I said everybody <laughs> refuses to accept that <laughs> yeah I mean I sort of feel like that's actually maybe we have like like generations are so sm small narrow mm -hmm. um, you know it, in, in architecture but I feel like that generation is sort of the generation that was right after our generation. I mean, I think that there's, I, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd be curious what you mean by like, it produced it or it just shook it out or is maybe a reaction to the kind of abstraction of, of that came out of the possible mediums project. But I wouldn't say that the, I don't think a lot of the core people that are in that mm -hmm. necessarily are interested in the neo-postmodernist project. I, I'm interested in uh, in using the refusal as a symptom of uh, like some kind of cathected. Um, I mean, I see that as a psychoanalytical problem. Like, why would you refuse a, something that someone tells you? Like, you, if you tell your kid you're being bad and they're like, no, I'm being good. Like, then you see, oh, you have a psychoanalytical. Um, right, like, <laughs> like you, you are rejecting my authority, and so we have a problem, right? Um, and and I think it's interesting to see that you calling it even generational, which is of course a, a definition of a family, right? Like you see yourself as having had children already, and 
Um, and those children being bad children by being neo postmodernists or whatever. So I think <laughs> like, if it's bad children, I would just think it's with a slightly different. <laughs> yeah, <account>. wrong. <laughs> but um, to me, I think it's interesting to hear it as a as a psychoanalyst. We should psychoanalyze them back now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, come on, like yeah. there were a family or whatever, and and um, in a way. Uh, and and the, the the forms of authority that are being produced and the ways in which people get called names and so forth like that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's precisely like why I even bring it up. You yeah. know, it's not really to put you on the spot here. You know, <laughs> it's not. It's it's really to uh, precisely get at this point of uh, about authority. Yeah. You know, because uh, I think uh, it's in order to construct that authority, it has to have its own history. I think ultimately, uh, unless there's some very specific uh, technical apparatus that's incredibly powerful and economically viable that, you know, then becomes the authority or some other kind of thing, you know. So I think uh, uh, it, it is, uh, I think, a, a historical project on some level because, uh, as I understand it from you, it, there is a real question here about how to reconstruct the discipline, you know, and to emphasize that. Therefore, I think that w what makes me very curious about that Know, then in relationship to, say, whether or not it's neo Pomo or not. It is a historical debate, ultimately, whether it is that or not. You know, so I think it's ultimately going to be left to you know, those people that construct the history. But it seems to also touch on the recent discussions about indifference. And I wonder, Christy, how you, if you tap into that at all, Michael Meredith's, uh, the two, Michael Meredith and Mark Foster Gage, the two articles in the recent issues of Log, where Michael Meredith is sort of saying, okay, there is a, a kind of, um, I don't know if he would say aesthetics of indifference, but there is indifference as an agenda amongst a certain generation. I think a few people he names, I mean, it's very powerful how the act of naming is also, like the moment you say this group might include such, 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 and uh, it's sort of like with the, uh, the New Ancients, I mean, we've seen a lot of this happening, yeah. and that creates the sort of you start to inscribe the history and create and construct the history, and you give that a certain authority. And then members of that are named there often say, no, no, no. I mean, it's just like with the deconstructivist show. I mean, a lot of people said, I am not, you know, no decon, not me. Um, so the labeling, I, I mean, I don't know, does that, uh, does the discussion about indifference, has that been something any of the possible mediums group has? Um, taken on or rejected? I mean, I think, is Ellie in, the, Ellie and Adam? Play? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, um, I think they're explicitly, she's named as, as the new indifference. The new indifference. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think we definitely, um, you know, leaned, leaned hard on sort of um, Michael and Hillary's interest in sort of defining the sort of large subgenre of how architecture could be practiced. I think that was something that we were looking at a lot when we were um, starting uh, starting our discussions. Um, so I think that there was the parallel there. I, I think the, um, at least at its initial ambitions, I don't think it was, um, I, I would say it was not interested in indifference. It was actually about defining something that you are really interested in, and that you were willing to sort of say, I'm prioritizing this, and by prioritizing this, I am, you know, I'm, I'm willing to sort of go out on a limb and have, say, I, I'm developing an expertise in that, which, I mean, I think is in some ways the opposite of indifference. Like, you're sort of um, making a claim of, like, I think this is important, and I'm going to prioritize this within my design practice at the moment. Um, so I, I personally, I mean, I can't speak for everyone in the possible mediums group, but I think that um, most of the conversations and I think the core of how people were working on things at the time was, I would say, was not related to indifference, that it could just be sort of. Because um, I think, I mean, I think the indifference, I should qualify it, it was studied indifference, I think. It really is the, the sort of by refusing to be overtly and obviously sincere or politically engaged or that, that not indifference as like actual indifference, but the a sort of, mm -hmm. you know, astute indifference, like the appearance of saying, I will not 
you know, place the message out there. I want the work to remain somewhat maybe inscrutable or ambiguous um, in order to provoke a, a higher degree of engagement. Because mm -hmm. if the work is, you know, there are a lot of projects where I think, as, as Meredith points out, the whole um, you know, sort of ecological imperative and work that is kind of very overtly about a particular issue and is very sincere and engaged. But then there's work that appears to not engage with those things in a provocative way. Mm -hmm. And I think it allows you to raise other questions. And maybe that is a parallel to some of the stuff that was going on with the natural science um, kind of agenda being imported into some of the work that was going on at Columbia in the 90s. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I see a parallel there. but. Well, uh, because we're getting towards uh, the end, I want to dare uh, some conclusions. You know? So I think uh, uh, there are some obvious uh, you know, big questions on the table, I think. Uh, should we get rid of history from the architectural education and stick purely to the technical? That's one. And I think most would say no, you know, but I don't know. I, I'm curious, you know, like uh, the other I think is, um, is there a, a right way to use precedents uh, or maybe we just shouldn't or uh, I think a number of comments have been made about how uh, in support of uh, the precedent being uh, not history or like a precedent is maybe uh, uh, there's a kind of strange absence of abstraction in precedent is too uh, mired in a specific space and time for it to ever be a problem of history. Uh, so it kind of mirrors the, Locke, the John Locke quote that Ryan brought up. Right? And then finally, uh, I, I think um, uh, I got to correct myself. There was one consistency in the kind of call to bring us uh, all your reports of how, what you teach in the court. There was one consistency, and that was the presence of uh, uh, at least a declaration of an, an ambition to teach abstract thinking and or critical thinking. And I found it in general uh, reading through the mission statements of as many architectural schools as I could read, incredibly sloppy thinking. You know, it seemed unclear what these words even meant anymore to invoke uh, the word abstract and to invoke the word critical. So I think uh, that's really the final question. I mean, uh, why do we teach abstraction? Uh, why do we say we're going to teach you to think abstractly? What do, we, what do we mean by that? Have you ever said that to a student? You know, I, I think I have myself. You know, and now I wonder, like, what exactly do I mean by that? And maybe uh, just as a kind of opening move, uh, just to put myself on the line for a second. I think what I meant was precisely this thing of uh, unmiring the student from this specific circumstance of a time and place. That uh, you're just being overrun by the day-to-day -day and the reality of things and what's possible. So to unmoor them from the roots of the real, it required some form of abstract thinking to de-affiliate it from a specific time and place, right? from, to de-affiliate it from circumstance. But then once you do that, then like, how do you go back again? Because obviously we're not content with just producing wonderful abstractions, right? That we want to put it somehow back into the real, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at some point, I mean, this is where philosophically this gets really fun and weird. And I always thought like one of the most striking things about Graham, I mean, from the beginning, was really not the, the more intricate discussions about objectness, but just uh, this basic conclusion that the the real is abstract already, you know? Yeah. And, and I think it's kind of an interesting thing to debate because we wouldn't think the real is abstract. Like it's the opposite of the abstract. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't agree with that conclusion. Yeah. I, I, I was trying to figure out what it was. So uh, there's this line in, the, in Kant's logic where he says um, abstraction or abstracting is what you do when you say that the scarlet scarf, you, you, you know that the scarf has the color scarlet, and you can abstract the scarlet from the scarf, which is to say it's time and place, but that you can hold that concept as different from the reality of that object. And you can hold that difference 
but that difference relies on its materiality and its its uh, uh, its particularity, which you intuit. But then you hold this concept in your mind, and you so it's fun. Abstraction is fundamentally empirical. It's fundamentally related to having experience of the world and having to produce concepts from that world. So I don't believe you can ever get rid of it, and I, I don't think you can collapse one onto the other. And then, so then, insofar as we can have a, like an empirical concept, right? Then, like if you fall back into empiricism, like having Kant having read Hume saying, "Well, is everything just that?" Mm. Um, he says, "No, actually, there's there's still room for what he calls a sort of synthetic concept, like." Uh, like something completely pure in, in reason. So we, we actually can't let ourselves be fooled into thinking everything is just empirical in a temporary and contingent relationship between our concepts and objects. There is something like pure reason. And this is where critical comes in, right? So that's where truth lies, mm -hmm. right? There is a capacity for us to make those statements that are completely, ab as it were, completely abstract, pure. But abstraction doesn't belong to that world, it belongs to this world. It's the world in which we kind of keep creating distance from the objects that we experience. It, this is pure thought, this, uh, pure reason. This is, this is abstraction. So abstraction relies on actually being able to reinsert truth into the world, mm. right? Like, insofar as we have a politics as a field, it would be about doing that, about relating our concept back into the materiality of the mm -hmm. world. And sort of pure reason doesn't allow us that. That's just pure truth. Mm -hmm. So insofar as it's a kind of compromised system, mm -hmm. I, I think that I would agree with all the mission statements of all the schools, because insofar as we ever create knowledge that is effectual <laughs> on the world, it has to be abstract. It has to have a relationship in which we are divorcing or or temporarily divorcing a concept from an object, mm. one which will reassert itself on the world when we allow it to rematerialize. Mm. So, yeah, I think there is some, something like pure knowledge, maybe, um, mm. but there, I think that is so fundamental to what I understand to be a, a, a political training in any kind of world, whether that material object is text, in my case, or in an architect's case, is it might be a building or might be any other things that architects produce in the future. I think that it's the reassertion of, of your concepts into reality. That's what abstract, that's what I hope you're teaching when you teach abstract. So in some sense, this is the contrary to say the kind of joke about the, the trade school, like uh, where there's nothing but engaging real practice. Uh, I guess uh, what you're saying is there's no abstraction or criticality thereby because of that. Right. Yeah. So uh, you're saying this kind of disassociation, say, then from the real is actually a very positive thing. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. But, but he's right. saying it's the only thing. Right? I mean, yeah. That's what you're saying. It's, it's the, the only, it's the the way only you, thing. You it's produce the, knowledge. Yeah, right? yeah. But it's also maybe on a much, sort of more trivial level, I think, um, <clears throat> in terms of teaching design studio and what abstraction means, um, I'm a bit reminded to the discussion we had yesterday about the original and the copy and the real and the mm. fake. And um, I, I think, rightfully or not, I, in, in design studio we often use abstraction also as a means to describe originality. Yeah. Right? The thing, if you're not thinking abstract, yeah. you cannot arrive at an original. So the original um, is inherently based in some level of abstraction, right? And, and we kind of posit a world of precedents and existing things on the one side, and then a world of progressiveness or, or like, you know, innovation and so forth on the other side, and abstraction is basically the bridge upon mm -hmm. which we walk there, mm -hmm. or not, we fall, or whatever, you know, but we try. And then again, it's like, the, you know, to me that's also the sort of 250 year tradition since Kant, at least, right, of like that's how we have to do it. And abstraction really is that, that means to, to that particular end, to, to find an original. So I was reminded to late yesterday's discussion where we questioned that, right, or you, David, in particular, question mm -hmm. that there can ever be an original. Are we not constantly sort of um, inside more and more copies, right? I mean, what that means to the notion of abstraction also. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, I mean, just, uh, you know, uh, in relationship to, I, I think what's unique about right now is uh, the amount of labor and money it takes to make a copy is so negligible, mm. you know, so easy, unlike any previous time in history. So I think just it crosses some threshold because of how easy it's become to copy things. That's why, in effect, we're absolutely inundated and surrounded by copies of images like we never have been before. You know, so I think it's it's just a, an interesting question for me. Like, uh, what changes because of that? Because of the ease, and so I think uh, uh, I wouldn't. Uh, be one of the people accusing the projects of, or any project today, as neo-pomo, because I think it's too easy to apply precedent and signifiers and references. Uh, that because of that, I don't think it can ever be the kind of semi-critical practice of uh, postmodernism, which, on some deep level, like uh, I, I have a little bit, I have some sympathies towards that, I, because I, I, I do remember what they were trying to do. <laughs> You know, it, I, I think it's a project that went horribly wrong, right? And but uh, I don't think uh, it's something that uh, it's like a closed book that we put away. I think uh, there are there were early kind of tremors about a type of project problem that I think we're really deeply facing today in this kind of insanity of multiplication of mm -hmm. the image. Uh, like Instagram is, I think what. Pomo was afraid of, uh, or saw coming, you know, and like, better deal with it, right? And, and then it just became window dressing for corporate modernism, and then, all right, that's over. You know? So, so I think I, uh, maybe uh, 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 just one last point is I think it sounds like uh, uh, we're uncomfortable with uh, the more we talk about precedent, the more uncomfortable we get about what's implied in it, you know. So I, I, maybe we could begin to wrap up here. Just uh, you know, I, I'm curious what you all think of this. Like, uh, should we simply avoid using that word? I mean, I mean, we're kind of obligated to because it's already in the NAB language. But somehow it doesn't seem to really capture the spirit of uh, the problem of authority and history and the role of abstraction and criticality. That it actually seems to be the kind of uh, obstacle. You know, towards all of this. Yeah. yeah, I always think of precedent as a pl as like in plan view, kind of. That's like, that's what I always think of precedent as like, how do you lay this out? Mm. It's a very like mm. simple hmm. kind of excuse for like why why you did something. Mm. Yeah. Whereas all these other ideas we're talking about, I think, get into much more critical territory. Of, mm. um, but the plan would be sort of the essential datum. Mm whereby you can make the comparisons. I think that's what is useful. I mean, you could do that some, like, I guess, some have done that through the elevation, the comparative elevation study, but the, the plan would be a way of kind of essentializing certain information. I mean, we could argue whether that's valid or not valid, but I think that's exactly why you think of plan, which it's is standardizing. Yeah, I don't it, know if it, is, it allows you to kind essence. of level the, the field, like how do we compare these things? So yeah. we have to remove all the yeah. other information and context and just sort of lay out the plan. Yep. And yeah. that's I don't yeah. I think I would totally disagree. I, I think it not necessarily with you. I think with Matt <laughs> saying that like precedent as plan or like as image, I think you know that it's um I, for me a precedent can be just the way you bracket out something. So you could for for example, I think you could look at the precedent of volume and and you could tour a hundred atriums or cathedrals or train sheds or these types of things, and there wouldn't be like that. Absolutely, is a lens of precedent as well, right? So I think that there, the way we're taught like formal analysis, the way we're taught buildings in like um, history class, we often look at the plan, and so I think there's that association. But I think we can um, we sort of have some res we have some responsibility to help students see past work or past experiences not just through that way. So I would not be an advocate of getting rid of the precedent because it's um, well, limits, but actually just sort of changing 
what could be a precedent, and how do we understand well, just, precedent? Um, I, I think my dispute with precedent that I'm reading is really more the, the word, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Not that we stop looking at projects very close, closely, but we could also just refer to that as canonical work, or yeah, masterpieces, I, I to say that. or things uh, you need to know, like projects, previous projects, <laughs> you need to know if you want to <laughs> be able to call yourself an architect, right? Now, that's different from, I think, uh, the word precedent, which implies evidence, hmm. you know? Uh, like a kind of, you use the precedent to make an argument, right? Not to inform your sensibility or your disciplinary understanding, right? So I, I think this is more of kind of a word choice issue that I'm seeing, like, which brings with it all kinds of baggage about how to think about it, then, yeah. I think, I think that actually, I don't want to take issue with that. I think that precedent is absolutely, now, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm going to argue it through mm -hmm. Michael, that, uh, or through Michael's read of Kant, that, uh, that precedent is absolutely necessary and actually is incredibly useful in it because it's the place where criticality gets to act on the real. Mm -hmm. Because if we're talking about, ab like, abstraction as taking the real and turning it into concepts, so which architecture's job is always going to be taking those concepts and turning them back into mm -hmm. the real, so they're exact opposites. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, that's why you can't have a technical, uh, a purely technical program because you wouldn't be abstracting and then turning it back into a, a kind of a reformulation. You don't get the original again if it's a copy because you haven't done the process of pulling it out of the real right. and putting it back into the real as something else, right? right? But if criticality is that other thing, that pure knowledge that's acting separately, and if precedent is simply copying something of the form without abstracting it, then criticality is the act that allows us to choose what portions of established form, what solutions that were already on the table, we, we, we redeploy without abstracting. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think that precedent, I think it is evidence. I think it, I, I, would, I would say that precedent in the way that we as architects look at it, it is evidence mm -hmm. and it does establish mm -hmm. our judgment, mm -hmm. right? Like, because if we look at the evidence of 50 cathedrals and we understand that, mm -hmm. then we are then form our own judgment in terms of how we want to. Um, well, maybe, maybe here's another way to get even more specific than to possible pedagogies is, uh, is the precedent appropriate in the move towards abstraction or is the precedent uh, appropriate in the move towards the real, right, from abstraction? Like, uh, do, I, do we uh, assign precedent in, as a way to develop new abstractions? Or do we use precedence in our move towards taking our abstractions and making proposals like Ryan. into the real, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, uh, so in that sense, like, uh, sure, I, I might want to see a plan to see what a so-called real plan looks like, to <laughs> looks like uh, just how the expertise of space planning and circulation and all the kind of uh, health, safety, and welfare legislations are uh, embedded into the plan and. I use the precedent as a way to formulate my argument for why this abstraction needs to be entering it back into the real, right? So, so there, you know, it, it's an interesting distinction, I think, for me, because we often assign the precedent as a way to construct abstractions, you know? Whereas, uh, and, and there is this tendency to see the same abstractions over and over again. So, so it always uh, was a point of interest for me, like why did you need that precedent you know, to develop the production of uh, abstract thought or enacting the criticality that seems the thing everybody agrees about as being somehow necessary. And, yeah. You know, I, I would even say mm -hmm. not only would I want to keep precedent, I would even want to keep canonical work as precedent. Um, and the reason for that is, um, I think to me at least, in my own education, ongoing education as an architect, the histories that are being generated by canonical work over time take on a whole kind of other set of qualities that I think are really important to the discipline. <laughs> um, so it's not even so much about a particular example um, that you study, but it's an understanding how that particular example in time and then through the histories that are being developed through that example is advancing architecture in some way. And I think to participate in that, 
um, is something that I find rich and interesting. And I would not want to not have that for that particular reason. So it's not, I mean, I never used ever in my life or never gave my students a precedence in any kind of particular way, like, you know, you study this now and then you kind of understand it better. But I often use precedence, particularly for the reason of like, you know, just to, to have someone understand, um, you know, how discourse is being generated or cultural expressions being generated through certain types of canonical work in the history of architecture. And I think the knowledge of that or the recognition, the acknowledgement of that, I think is a really important part of education for me. You know, uh, back um, in the early days of computer, like a seat of softmage would be like $40,000. Right? It would be like $40,000 to get a seat, one seat of softmage when it was first being used, right? Now, like, I mean, you can't give it away, you know, like, uh, right? And, but uh, also, like, uh, we can observe a company like Autodesk that has kind of cornered the market on digital software. You know, they freely uh, give licenses to students, right? Okay, so the, the value of certain forms of technical expertise has been changing and evolving dramatically. So like uh, back in the late 90s, we might say, all right, uh, I become an expert in software. I have power because that software costs $40,000 and not everybody's going to get to learn it. Uh, but today, like uh, the technical expertise in, say, software, you could watch a YouTube video and learn how to do something, right? So in contrast, I think uh, historical understanding, I think the value of it is remarkably durable. You know, like it's hasn't gotten devalued like uh, technical expertise. But this is like the truth of all forms of technical expertise, they eventually get devalued, right? Yeah, so. yeah I don't know if that, yeah. I was thinking earlier to what we were talking about, how there's these ruptures of, of history, and they mm -hmm. often, I think, come with a, a new technology that then propels that, like industrialization and then the digital project, and then to maybe a lesser extent, postmodernism with the new ways we consumed images. And I'm wondering if today, like some of what you're talking about is related to uh, the, the even newer way in which we view images. And that there's a technological thing happening now, but it's not about how we make things, but it's about the sort of digital space around us. Mm -hmm. And if that's, if that's what's provoking some of these new ideas about abstraction and image and, mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, cut and paste, I, yeah, culture mm. and stuff like that. Mm. That's extremely interesting. I mean, to some degree, tomorrow night on the fourth night, fourth and final night, uh, you'll see the fiction and entertainment program presenting their work, seven o'clock to ten tomorrow. And I think they're very, uh, uh, I, I think this is a really interesting subtext for what they're doing and how they're working. I think to some degree, they're developing a, an expertise in this regard. You know, like how do you use social media space to one's advantage? and becomes a form of expertise and, you know. Um, all right, uh, we're, we have a little bit of time. I don't know if anybody wants to quiz the panel a little bit. Uh, is, there, is there a question that anybody's dying to ask before we wrap up here? Can't even, how about from the students? Uh, how about from those that uh, provoked uh, the panel discussion? Uh, Um, like depending on sort of what you're thinking, but it seems like one thing that's sort of left unsaid by the discussion on, on like how we teach history or precedent or whether we should teach history and precedent is this kind of like, um, let's say, idea that maybe goes back to something Michael said um, when we were talking about authority and like the psychoanalytical um, desire to sort of reject authority or to somehow deal with it and express some kind of in individuation. It seems like one of the things that, that comes from like, like a generational model is a sense that something has happened, now I come along and I have to do something with it, at least as a designer or as a practitioner or whatever that is. Um, and I'm, I'm curious like where you guys think like that those desires come from like is it only a psychoanalytical thing that we have to sort of establish problems and find new problems or revert back to sort of an authority of disciplinarity to sort of um, 
give ourselves credence in what we're doing, or is it, uh, are there other maybe, let's say, um, motivating factors as why these things happen outside of either capital or, um, uh, uh, yeah, like your own sort of internal like anxiety, which is uh, often maybe what those, what those emotional problems come from, I don't know. Oh, no, I mean, I think, uh, what is it, capitalism and schizophrenia? Like, uh, there are only two determinants for Deleuze and Guattari, like either your psychic world is being structured um, by power or your wallet. And like those are the two determining forces um, basically of change. So no. You're such hippies. <laughs> but it's great because it, you only have to worry about two things. Are you getting paid and do you feel good? And um, or if you're not getting paid, you might as well feel good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Like exactly. <laughs> Fascism and capitalism. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, it's just like um, I think just to be. I mean, like when I hear a cathected moment of rejection and and the invocation of generation, I think this is a moment in which we should be like careful about about asserting someone else's authority by rejecting it. Right. So be careful about rejecting mantles that are foisted upon you because you're just instantiating their power. Be careful, right? Or when you don't get paid for what you do, be careful. <laughs> like the Biennale or whatever. Like, what is that about? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and and then what kind of power is that? If it's not affecting your brain, but it's affecting your wallet, is it? Is that making you happy? Like, um, you know, are, is everybody in the Biennale a hippie? I don't know, but like, those are the things I think. But uh, you don't uh, include any principle of investment uh, in your worldview. I mean, the world of capitalism runs on a kind of principle of investment, like uh, something deployed without immediate return, right? Mm -hmm. Which constitutes risk, and then risk uh, constructs uh, profit, ultimately. So, I don't, I don't know, like uh, sometimes I think it's easy to overstate uh, uh, the dominance of uh, the economic because uh, it, I think it leads to a kind of obsession with counting every penny, which is, I think, foolhardy. Oh. You know, because I think the more uh, intricate forms of economic deployment are more difficult to trace in that respect. So I think a lot of these kinds of cultural institutions are famous for taking on enormous risk, right? But ultimately, it constructs something. You know, I don't think it's, I, I'm, I'm here completely disagreeing with you that I think uh, there are other sneakier, more difficult to trace scenarios of how the psychic and the wallet uh, gets transformed. You know? I, I, I just think that just to, I mean, I, I, I agree with your disagreement. The, uh, I, I, I think that there are, are investments that you can see p paying off, and you see that through your psychic pleasure, mm -hmm. right? Like writing a draft of a paper, investing in it, throwing it away, re coming back to it, what have you. Nobody's paying you money for that. That's wasted time in a way. Mm -hmm. But, but it gives you pleasure or whatever. Whatever it is that, that you're doing, you're seeking out knowledge, mm -hmm. you're finding it, you're producing it, you're mm -hmm. reproducing it, and you're copying it. Whatever it is that is giving you pleasure. But I think, mm -hmm. so to, to my view, what you're saying is an investment on the capitalist level. Mm -hmm. Like, if, you know, I see the problem with the Biennale is it's kind of a Ponzi scheme, which is more or less a kind of <laughs> Bernie Madoff sort of taking money from this person, giving it to this person, and then taking it back from that person and giving it to this person again. Like, <laughs> like this is scary shit, you know, like. By the way, I think Matt just wrote an article <laughs> about uh, Venice Pino, you know? Uh, <laughs> Chicago. Yeah. Oh, the Chicago one? I'm just worried about that, because that doesn't fit into capitalists' notion of investment, because you could potentially use that pun. Like, I bet people made money off of Madoff. <laughs> but like, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not so. Uh, I think you're making an unfair argument. 
to compare it to something that's clearly illegitimate, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, all right, it looks like a banana is a banana. It may not be one, you know? So I, I, I don't think it's so clear cut to me that it is such a illegitimate Ponzi scheme, but I, I think it's difficult to trace it, you know? Yeah. I, I, and it's, it really depends on ultimately also how the history is written. You know, what looks like a Ponzi scheme today may not, you know, later on, you know, if it yielded something that's seen of, as great value, you know, so I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how we got on this, subject, except for the fact that we're always enjoying these kind of disagreements with each other. <laughs> uh, is, is there anything else? All the way in the back. Yeah. Uh, and we're 10 minutes from close, so it's probably going to be it. All right, just a quick question. Um, so uh, I, went to, I got my air mark back in the 90s too, and I'm back in school again now. And I'm just noticing this huge change in the way that studio is um, organized. So back when I was in school, studio was given a problem, like let's say design a school or something of that sort. And then you, you had to come up with a party, you know, an idea, and develop that party into an architectural solution. And there was actually no place for theory, really. I mean, theory was something you did outside of studio. And I'm just wondering now, it seems like when, you, when one does a studio, it starts with this really strong theoretical basis. And then everybody has to try it in the studio to produce something that conforms or engages in the dialogue of that theory. And I'm just wondering, it seems like a huge transition from really studios with no theory to studios based on purely on theory and a, an abstraction. And I wonder when that happened, when that transition took place, and maybe have something to say about that. By the way, Freda, he was a, a graduate of Penn. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Where you teach. I don't know. I mean, I, I think uh, if I jump in here, I, in, in a way, party is, is a conceptual theoretical concept, too to a certain degree, just that word, you know, comes with all kinds of connotations. But I think, I, I don't know if it's so much a matter of time, but that the times have changed and now there's more theory in, in studio. I don't know if, if, if I could say that. It's more, I guess, the schools, you know? Um, different schools operate in different ways, and I think that's obviously still very much the case today. Um, I, to me, the schools I have come to know as, as a student as well as later on as a, as a teacher, um, what is interesting is, is like how much the theoretical part in studio is being, um, you know, advertised or how strongly it echoes in the projects themselves and, you know, if it is something that is almost being generating, um, you know, some kind of a formula through which the work is then being evaluated, right? You come up with a theoretical concept and then the work has to sort of fulfill some kind of a mission by, by getting there. Um, I, I think that was more the case in the older days as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's a different kind of theory that is being um, brought to studio culture today. And I think that kind of um, works in, in the direction of the discussion we had been earlier having here as well. I think there's, to me, there's always some kind of a cycle um, between a kind of more strong approach to theory in design studio, right? So again, in the, let's say in the digital heyday, um, there was a lot of theory and that was in the 90s, right? It was just a different kind of theory. It was like based on, um, science, but it wasn't only about scientific, um, you know, facts. It, it was about the theory of science, right, and in the way how it, it was read as a cultural condition, right? I mean, you were still reading scientific conditions, and you were bringing them back into some kind of theoretical format, and then the students would sort of work through that. And I think that has completely kind of gone away. But, um, to me, it's more a transformation of how theory is being presented in design studio um, and, and not some kind of a zeitgeist that has 
completely changed. I mean, I would agree with Ferda. I think it's really dependent upon the school that you go to. Um, as I was mentioning before, I previously had a very conventional education in my undergrad. Then I went to the Architectural Association when Alvin Boyarsky was still leading that pedagogy. Mm. And the amazing thing there was that not only within each studio would you have a different pedagogical model, but the whole constellation of studios was kind of um, hand-picked in order to create a kind of friction between different ways of teaching upper-level studios. Well, it was also in the intermediate studios as well, the diploma intermediate system. Um, and even here, it's a discussion, I think, that I've had with the design theory pedagogy students when I taught the studio last semester. And they were each uh, kind of mentoring um, or shadowing one of the vertical studios here. And we sat down and we often talked about the different approaches, because you'll find some studios that still operate on the, you know, the common thing on the table is the program and the site. And that's like, and then they can take it anywhere. I mean, you can really see this right here at SciArc. Um, other studios, there is a very specific problem and there's a lineage to that problem. And you can look at the studio brief over the past three years and see how that particular instructor has advanced that problem and maybe decided there's a point, an end point for that line of interrogation and then shifts and there's another topic that is introduced. So I think it really is about um, the pedagogical model. And, and some schools do not, you know, the trade school example that was brought up before, I mean, the, that, uh, the sort of models that are operative here at a school like SciArc would maybe not be, uh, would not exist there at all. So, yeah, I think it's a, real, it's a question of pedagogy. It really gets to the core of, of this, uh, the content of this program. Well, I, I think, uh, um, I, I, thinking back um, when I was younger, I, I had no interest whatsoever in the history of pedagogy. And then, at some moment, I started becoming curious because I started realizing that there were other pedagogies. So I think uh, one enters into the discipline expecting that uh, the discipline has remained intact for thousands of years or it's always been this way. The moment you pointed out, well, how old do you think it is? Like you think about it and go, oh, wow, yeah. It couldn't possibly be old, you know? And so I think uh, uh, once you realize that, you begin to realize pedagogy is a historical phenomenon in itself. And it's deeply connected to ideologies and to political circumstances and social economic context. So it should, uh, uh, as it has for me, like uh, kind of wake up a kind of desire to read the current situation as a way to understand uh, what's at stake for us now. Because it tells us something. Uh, so like that quote by, you know, that uh, reference to Benjamin's manifesto of history, uh, you know, the present makes a constellation with the past. That's history, right? So it just becomes a way to understand the present, I think, as all histories are, right? So I think uh, the point here, uh, Daniel, I think is, uh, I think it's a history that hasn't, that's been, it's a history project that's been neglected. I think uh, doing a history of pedagogy, I think, uh, I think uh, there's something at stake there, you know? And it hasn't, uh, maybe like the younger version of me, we haven't thought that was an important history to develop. But it, I think it's turning out that it's a kind of a crucial one you know, for the discipline moving forward. Yeah. 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 Did you have anything? Yeah. I think that's a good way to. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just curious to give the journalist the uh, last word, you know, <laughs> just from the aerial perspective. I mean, there's not a lot of coverage of this stuff in any kind of media. Mm. Not that many people write about schools. We, we go to schools to get ideas, but we mm -hmm. don't necessarily talk about specific things happening there. Mm. So I don't know what that would look like, mm. but it might be something to think about. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, that's day three. Uh, come back tomorrow for Fiction and Entertainment. It begins at uh, 7 o'clock. Okay. Later start tomorrow. There's going to be booze and food, so. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you may want to come back. Okay. Thank you.